forget to oh. let me record the presentation now. So you want me to start all over again? Oh, uh, it's okay. You can go, go. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, so um, I was just saying that. Uh, let me get my uh, pointer in here. Um, what happened to my pointer? Um, let me do it again. Yeah. Okay, so, um, here, what we uh, want to talk about is that what if you have uh, varying roughness? What does that mean? That means so over the uh, along the coastline, there are cities and there are grassland and there may be licks and so on. So different uh, land cover will therefore have different surface roughness. So what happens if the tropical cyclone is about to make landfall over a city or uh, next to a, a grassland or next to a forest, then what will be whether the track will change or not. So then the second part is to uh, talk about the effect of topography. Now, obviously, uh, many places will have uh, high topography and I will use uh, Taiwan as the main example to uh, see how the topography actually will change the, the track. Okay. All right, so let's start out with the effect of differential surface roughness and, uh, and start again with the uh, flat plane, uh, flat terrain on an F plane. So let's look at a very simple experiment. This is the simplest experiment you can ever get. So this is a domain, huge domain, six, uh, uh, 7,000 kilometers square, okay? And then we, half of that is what we call land and half of that is what we call sea. And I'll tell you what, the differences in terms of the uh, surface properties. Then we uh, nested that into a, 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 a finer mesh in here and put this tropical cyclone right close to the, to the land, all right? So that's a simple, and because this is F-plane, so there's um, no beta effect. So as a control experiment, um, we, ran the experiment with no land, okay? So uh, everything over here is just the ocean. And S stands for smooth. So ocean is smooth. So the friction is relatively small. And W means wet. So the moisture in the atmosphere, so this is a full biochemical model, okay? So it's not, uh, not a biotropic. So there we include the moisture. So here you have a smooth ocean, a smooth uh, surface plus very wet conditions. So wet meaning that the relative humidity is uh, ninety percent. Okay. Now, so what do you see? What you see here is zero zero is where the tropical cyclone started, and it, it really hasn't. It doesn't do anything. So it, these the different uh, small movement is probably due to the way that we de we determine where the center is. So there's basically there's no movement in it. Then we ran the second experiment, which is that you have a land on the western side. And uh, however, the land has the same roughness as that of the ocean. So that's why it's called smooth. So the entire domain has the same roughness as this one. The difference between these two is that the land, now the land part is dry. Dry meaning that the relative humidity is 10%, okay? So it's very dry. Uh, however, if you have a dry land, but a very smooth surface, the vortex still doesn't move. Now, why doesn't it move? Because as we all know uh, from yesterday, that the reason why when you, when you have a trouble cyclone, uh, on a beta plane, when it, the reason why it moves is because of the beta effect. But on an F plane, there's no beta effect. So therefore, uh, the tropical cyclone on an F plane should not move, 
Okay, there's no there's no physic physical mechanism to push it one way or the other. So um, that's why you can see that there is no movement in here. Either the SW experiment or the SD experiment. However, <clears throat> now if you run that experiment, when you have the land being rough, R means rough. So the surface roughness here is 10 times that over here. Okay. And it's wet. So the moisture supply from here and here are exactly the same. Okay. So there's no difference in terms of moisture supply. The only difference between this experiment and, and this experiment is that it's, one is S, one is R. So this part has a rough, rough land. Okay. Rough, rougher surface. So now what you see here is now that this, the tropical cyclone, the vortex, is actually moving towards the southwest, towards the land. And there are some oscillations in here, uh, but uh, we are not sure what this oscillation is. So let's try to ignore that at the moment and just focus on this drifting of the, of the vortex in, uh, towards land, okay? So in other words, when you have uh, a rough surface, then it seems that the vortex will be quote unquote attracted towards the rougher land, all right? Now, if you uh, change the, the land surface to a very dry, again, I said 10% relative humidity, then you, so, so the difference between two, these two experiments is only in the moisture content. So this is wet, this is dry, but again, there's a bit of a difference in terms of the track, but basically it's the same thing. The, the vortex is being attracted towards the land, okay? So if you look at these four experiments, the conclusion is that the moisture content is probably not contributing very much because if you can see in here that both of these are dry, right? These are dry, but one uh, this one doesn't move if the surface uh, is smooth, but it, the vortex will move if the surface is rough. So therefore, the, the two conditions, the roughness of the surface and the moisture availability of the surface, if you look at these two conditions, obviously the moisture availability is not very important, but the roughness is very important. The, the, uh, the rougher land is going to cause the, a vortex to move towards the land even if it's on an airplane. So that's the numerical result. So can we explain this? So let's try to pick this one here because this is more realistic that you have rough and dry, right? So on the, on, uh, generally speaking, over land, you have rougher land and the moisture content is a bit less. So therefore you, we will try to study this uh, experiment a bit more to understand why you have this uh, change in the in the track. So to do this, we look at, we do something like very similar to what we talked about yesterday, looking at the asymmetric flow. That means you subtract the symmetric part of the flow and then look at the asymmetric part. Then we look at um, three layers. Okay, so the, the top left panel is the boundary layer. Uh, so on the sigma level, it is uh, between 0 0.9 and 1.0. Uh, and then we look at the lower level, lower layer, uh, which is between uh, sigma 0 0.9 to sigma 0 0.55. So this is in the uh, lower to mid troposphere. And here is in the upper troposphere from uh, 0 0.5 to 0 0.55, okay? So what we're showing here is the, sh the shading indicates the magnitude of the asymmetric flow. And then the, the, the streamline show the, the direction of the flow. So if you look at the uh, boundary layer first, now remember the tropical cyclone is rotating like this, right? So therefore after one day, you will see that there is a convergence in here and a divergence in here. This is the asymmetric flow. Now that's quite understandable, right? Because you think about this, that as the tropical cyclone moves from the, the, the ocean towards the land, then it goes from a smooth surface 
to a rough surface. So therefore the wind over here, over the ocean must be larger than the wind over the land, right? So therefore, as a result of that, if you subtract the azimuthal average tangential wind, then obviously you will have, the, the wind here will be uh, weaker. And so therefore it shows a convergence like that, okay? Now, conversely, if you look at the offshore side, so uh, then the air is going from a, a rougher surface to a um, smooth surface. So therefore there will be an acceleration. The, the, the wind becomes faster because the, the friction is reduced. So therefore there will be an acceleration. And as a result of that, you will see that there's a divergence in terms of the, of the streamline, based, based on the streamlines, okay? So in other words, you can think about this, that when the tropical cyclone is about to make landfall, that's what we already, uh, it's intuitively very simple, is that on the onshore side, you will have convergence. On the offshore side, you will have divergence. Now, so this is the boundary layer. In the lower layer, <clears throat> so what happens is that when you have the convergence in here, it seems that then there is a divergence in here. And there's a conver convergence in here. So what you think about this is very simple. So in the, in the boundary layer, on the onshore side, you have convergence in the boundary layer, right? And so obviously when you have convergence, then the air rises. And so then in the mid, uh, in the mid troposphere, then there's a divergence. So there's this secondary circulation that's going on on the on onshore side with convergence in the boundary layer, rising motion, and then divergence uh, at the, in the metroposphere. okay? Now, on the offshore side, it's just the opposite. On the, near the surface, you have divergence, so therefore you must have sinking motion, and so therefore you have convergence in the higher levels and coming down like that, okay? And you can see a little bit of that as well in the upper levels, although the, the wind speed is relatively small. So basically what you see in here is that you will have a reverse of convergence divergence in the, in the lower layer along the coast. So you have convergence in the boundary layer, divergence uh, on the offshore side, but just the reverse uh, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, mid troposphere in the lower layer, but there's a very small magnitude in the upper layer. So this is after one day, okay? Now, Let's continue the integration for six days. Um, there's not much difference as you still have the convergence in here, uh, as you would expect that you have convergence on the onshore side and divergence on the offshore side. However, now at that time, the, the average between, uh, this is average between um, 120 hours and 144 hours. Now at that time, the tropical cyclone is just about to make landfall. And this is the direction of motion. Okay, in fact, if you, let me go back to this. So that direct, the tropical cycle just starts to move. So this is the direction of the movement of tropical cycle. Now in the lower layer, you see a bit different. So you will see that instead of a convergence and divergence as what you saw here, you have divergence and convergence in here, there's actually a pair of gyres Okay, now remember this is the F plane, so there's no beta gyres, okay? So you have, uh, you actually develop a pair of counter-rotating circulations with cyclonic rotation in here and counter-rotate, uh, anti-cyclonic ro rotation over here, okay? So because of this pair of gyres, um, then there is a flow going in that direction and the magnitude is about, so you can look at the shading in here, the magnitude is about one meter per second. Okay, right along the coast in here. However, the direction of motion is not exactly the same as this one here. So it, 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 there is a, a quote unquote steering flow, okay, associated with this pair of gyres pushing the storm pushing the vortex towards the south southwest. But the direction of motion is actually pointing more towards the southwest, okay? So it looks like that the uh,
steering flow generated like that is cannot explain the motion of the, the tropical cyclone completely. Now, if you look at the upper troposphere, you have very similar, but the, in the tropos, upper troposphere, the flow seems to be parallel. You also have this uh, pair of gyres, although it's not very obvious as the one in the mid troposphere. And then the top there, but the flow is quite largely parallel to that of the move, movement of storm. Okay. So if you think then about looking at going to the potential vorticity perspective, then this is what you will see. Okay, in the lower level, this is the PV budget. And if you look at the horizontal direction, this is the on right hand side, the top right hand corner is the horizontal direction. Now, if you recall, the flow is like that, right? So, therefore, you have the flow affecting uh, positive vo potential vorticity from here to here. And as a result of that, you have a maximum in here, maximum potential voltage. So this is again, wait, this is wave number one. Okay, so you, you decompose that like what we said yesterday. So you have wave, uh, a positive PV uh, tendency in here and a negative PV tendency in here due to the horizontal direction. Okay, however, as I said, the movement is actually in this direction. So why? Because in the you have a bit of the um, vertical advection, and actually the there's a modification of the the PV tendency by the diabetic heating. So there's actually negative values in here, positive values in here. So that what happens is that when you add these three terms up, you will have the uh, PV tendency like this. And, and, and that's why the tropical cyclone is moving in that direction. So the conclusion from here is that the, when you have a rough land like this, you generate a pair of gyres, then the gyres will then contribute towards the advection of PV. But at the same time, because of the convergence and divergence, you will then set up, because of the convergence, you will then set up more heating over here Right, because this is uh, rising motion. Remember, we say that it's rising motion over here. So therefore, you will have a positive heating in here and negative heating on the divergent side. Okay, on the on the on the offshore side, you have divergence, and so therefore, uh, they add up to cause the tropical cyclone to move like that. Okay, in the upper troposphere, um, then it is mostly because of this uh, value in the, 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 um, the horizontal direction, right? So it's very similar. However, the contribute, there is also some contribution from the other two terms as well. So the magnitude is still comparable. You can see the, the contours to be the same. So therefore the magnitudes of the DH uh, and the VA is a bit small. So it's mostly be contributed by the horizontal direction and the diabetic eating that causes the vortex to move in that direction. Okay, so the conclusion then is that the when you have a rough land, what happens is that the it changes the convergence and divergence pattern, which then changes the uh, the heating. Now, so so if you go back to here, uh, why do we have this one here? Why do we have this anti-cyclonic flow and this cyclonic flow in here? Now it's because when you when you start having the convergence in the lower levels, rising motion like this, and there's divergence, so therefore it starts to create an anti-cyclonic flow. And 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 here you have a convert uh, on the offshore side, you have divergence, and so therefore you subsidence, and so therefore you have a uh, you have the uh, the 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 vorticity therefore changes, and and these two, as a negative, as uh, has a has a has a has a nonlinear feedback, so that there is an equilibrium configuration in here, so that you will now have an anticyclonic circulation in here, and a cyclonic circulation in here, generating this advective flow. At the same time, the convergence in here then leads to more heating on this side and less heating over here and modifies the advection uh, 
by this by this uh, uh, ventilation flow, and as a result, the tropical cyclone moves in that direction. Okay, so now of course this is an average. Remember, you said this is an average over this this time period, and this we need to later on. I mean, if people are interested, you can still think about what is what are these um, oscillations now. People, of course, in the past have talked about uh, inertial oscillations uh, or, or small scale oscillations when a tropical cyclone is moving closer to the coast. But we, but have, there's never been very many observations. And uh, um, for example, uh, Hugh Willoughby many years ago has talked about the inertial oscillations as these, uh, these small loops, but we haven't done much on that. So we will not go through this anymore. Okay. Now um, you can actually do more experiments, and so if you put tropical cyclone in a, a different flow, so you have two. Uh, now, now they're the same tropical cyclone, but now you put in a background flow. So you have a background flow, a northeasterly flow, and then a southeasterly flow, and then obviously you would have the tropical cyclone moving towards the land like that. Now, if you have uh, uh, no land, it is in the, in, the, in the red. So obviously when you have a southeasterly flow, you will push the storm like that. Um, and the northeasterly flow will be like that. But what's interesting is that if you put in the friction now, when you have land, then there's a deviation of the track. Okay, so uh, again, this is uh, F, F plane. So there's a deviation, uh, from the case when there's no land. So this gives you a very important message is that whenever you want to predict landfall, the friction becomes very important. If you have the wrong representation in the model, then you will get a different forecast, okay? So that's the message that we have, right? So that's a, this is a very basic, um, the simplest experiment. Now, so um, let me just stop for one minute and see if there are any questions for this very fundamental concept of the effect of friction on the track. Okay, so any question or comments? All right, so if okay. not, let's go on. Excuse me, we have one question from Nino Sensei. Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, hi. Um, could you go back to the. Um, right, this. Um, you have a convergence in the boundary layer in the yes. up and no, northern part. Yes. And uh, I would think that. Uh, um there's a uh compensational heating yes. in, in the uh, above the convergence zone yes um but uh, i wonder if you have a divergence in the lower layer so that that means that uh, the, the um compensational heating um, I mean, acceleration by the uh, uh, condensational heating is not effective in this situation. Yes, uh, that's probably true. Uh, I we we haven't explored enough of mm -hmm. this, but if you uh, look at the the heating, right? Uh, obviously, in here, uh, this mm -hmm. is the low level, mm -hmm. so you can see that the the diabetic heating in here. Mm -hmm. You have positive heating, so they are uh, positive value. So therefore, this will be the where area where you have right. more heating. Mm -hmm. So uh, th there is still condensational heating, but what happens is that the, the air is rising. So therefore, there is condensational heating. But mm -hmm. what I'm showing here is that at, at the mid, in the mid to upper troposphere, there is divergence. So you, mm -hmm. have, you, you do have condensational heating, but it's, it's concentrated in in the lower troposphere mm -hmm. but uh, um since you have a divergence in the lower uh, troposphere 
um, that means that the, the uh, acceleration due to condensational heating is not large enough to to compensate the diver tendency. Actually, the uh, uh, divergence is only in the beginning. Uh huh. So this is one day. Right. There is a very obvious divergence in here, mm -hmm. right? However, uh, in here you can see there is really no divergence in there. In there. Mm. So there is still convergence in here in the boundary layer, but mm -hmm. the upper level or, or the even in the mid troposphere, uh, it, there's uh, the, the 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 there's not much divergence in here. You can mm -hmm. see that the, the the magnitude of the winds is quite uniform. Yeah, that's because of the two gyres, right? Yeah, 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 right. So therefore, but, uh, there is no obvious divergence mm, in the area. But the um, cause of the uh, anticyclonic gyre is uh, perhaps due to the divergence in, in the lower layer. And uh, uh, um, that, that is... Uh, um, Advected by the, the tangential flow of the cyclone is yes is it true yeah yeah, it, yeah. Um, um, actually um, I can't remember now so it's, it's mm. been quite a while but I think what what we found was that the uh, in the beginning in the beginning here you have the you have the divergence in here mm -hmm. and the divergence then generates an anticyclonic flow right uh, but then this anticyclonic flow is then being advected downstream and yeah. in some uh, but um somehow that um the con the continuous convergence in here uh kind of maintains this anticyclonic circulation mm -hmm. um so um that's that's how we we, we see mm. it that uh, uh but i think the uh, you, you're absolutely right that uh, you cannot have the di divergence and and very strong condensation of heating you should have a vertical right. motion. And, but in fact if you look at the rising motion mm -hmm. you can you can see in here that mm -hmm. the vertical action here mm -hmm. it's it's relatively small and, and it's in six in right. six days right mm -hmm. so uh um um so it's it's really I, I think we I, I uh, the, the the main thing is that you would generate this uh, rising motion through mm -hmm. the convergence mm -hmm. and that leads to the condensational heating mm -hmm. which then leads to the um, formation of the gyres and also the I um, mm -hmm. heating term yeah. Yes, yeah, so it it may be uh, I'm not sure, but uh, if the uh, amount of water vapor is enough to to have a larger condensational heating, this this uh, this gyres could be different. Or I I'm not sure, but uh, is it possible? <laughs> uh, actually, this is the 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 dry experiment, right? But in the wet experiment. You also oh, see this is a dry. This is a dry experiment. Yeah, but still you have a, a water vapor in the atmosphere, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. The water vapor is still plenty here mm. yes. over the ocean. Yes. Uh, but it's dry, dry over the land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's, that's a very good question. It's um, getting long, so, so I just uh, finish at this point. But uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, next, Endomoto-san, please. Okay, uh, very interesting mechanism. Um, I wonder why uh, the tropical cyclone start moving uh, southwestward when uh, it is far from the coast. And to make this mechanism to work, uh, we need uh, flow towards land uh, to the north and uh, towards the ocean. Uh, to the south. So I wonder how large is the uh, uh, vortex and how large, is, uh, how far uh, from the coast? Yeah, let me show, go back to this track in here. 
So, so here you can see that the, the tropical cyclone is quite close to the coast. So this is, we start out uh, when it's only 150 kilometers from the coast. So uh, if you assume that the tropical cyclone is about, uh, the, so, so when it's in the beginning, then only the very outer part of the circulation touches the land. Uh, and so this is a, that the tropical cyclone is not huge. It's, it's about the, the, uh, the radius maximum wind is about 100 kilometers. So the radius maximum is here, roughly. And um, the, uh, the outer circulation starts to touch it, but as it starts to move, then more of the circulation gets uh, injected into here. So it is true that maybe what we need to do later on is to look at the different um, size of the storm. So bigger size versus small size and see uh, how the acceleration or the change in the track might change. Uh, so at that, but at, for this study, we were only doing the simplest experiment. <laughs> so you, you located the tropical cyclone close to the land for yes. interaction. Yes. Okay, thank you yes. very much. Right, any, so let's move on. Any other question? No? Okay. Right, so, so obviously this is very um, theoretical. There's no, uh, so tropical cyclone generally are not on an F plane. So let's look at a, a, a bit more. What if, what if you have a, on a beta plane? Okay, so, uh, Again, we would run this experiment um, when the tropical cyclone is here on the beta plane. Now, this is again the uh, uh, rough, rough land and dry, okay? So RD is uh, rough land and dry. And NS means the north-south oriented coastline. The black line uh, is the control, uh, which means that there is no, uh, no rough land, okay? So, so basically it's just the beta effect moving like that. Now, if you have a uh, rough land now, rough and dry land, then as the tropical cyclone moves closer to the coast, so this is, uh, you can see the box in here. So this is about 460, 70 kilometers to 530. So that's about a hundred kilometers from the coast, then the track starts to deviate, okay? And uh, in fact, if you blow it up closer to the coast, you will see that there is a deviation like that, okay? When the, when the, when the uh, tropical cyclone, uh, it, will, it will be deviating towards the south, but it's not very much, only about 15 kilometers. Now, what if you have an east-west oriented coastline? So now you have a west-east, WE is west and east, and then again, rough and dry. So you have a land like this. Now the same, the blank is the same as before. So the beta effect causes the vortex to move towards the northwest. Now, if you have the, the east-west coastline, then the deviation is different. It's actually deviating this way towards the right of the storm. So then obviously you see from these two experiments that the orientation of the coastline becomes important when you include a beta effect. So if you have a north-south uh, oriented coastline, then the deviation is more towards the south. But if you have an east-west coastline, then the deviation is more towards the east or to the right of this, All right? So obviously we need to understand what, why this is the case. So to understand this, uh, we want to create a, a term called the land-induced flow. And the hypothesis is that of course, that the tropical cyclone circulation is the symmetric plus the asymmetry, asymmetry. The asymmetric flow is the beta gyres, which we all know, plus a land-induced flow, that looks just like what we showed you before on the gyres, okay? 
So this, obviously, this not linear induced flow is not present in the control experiment. So therefore, if you want to calculate the land induced flow, then you can, first of all, um, compute the asymmetric flow minus the beta gyres. But because in the control experiment, there is no land induced flow. So at that time, the asymmetric flow will just be simply the beta gyres. So what you can do is to identify the land induced flow is to calculate the asymmetric flow at landfall for the experiment minus the asymmetric flow in the control experiment. So that way then you can then look at what is the land induced flow, okay? Right, so let's look at this one here. This is after 48 hours of integration between 36 and 46 hours, uh, 48 hours. So here are two orientations. The shaded, the pink shaded is the land. So this is the north-south uh, land and this is the east-west. So the land induced flow, uh, the asymmetric flow, is that you will see that there is a, a very similar to what we had before. There is an anticyclonic gyre in here and a cyclonic in here. Okay. However, on the east-west oriented coastline, you still have the gyres, but the gyre orientation is different. So you have a cyclonic here and an anticyclonic in here. All right. So therefore, you will have so you, you have a, a in the in the north south um, oriented coastline because you have the flow like that, the tropical cyclone will be affected like that. On the other hand, for the uh, asymmetric flow associated with the east west coastline, you see that the gyres are like that, and so therefore the storm is moving more towards the east. And whereas this one is moving more towards the south. So why, why, is, why is there a difference in terms of the orientation of the gyres? And the reason is because the convergence and divergence is different. So this is... A, uh, excuse me, excuse me. So in the last slide, did you show... Excuse me, is this the... Uh, land induced flow. flow? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not including the better gyre. No, no, no. This is after you subtract the beta gyres. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. So this is a, you know, uh, purely, you, I, we think, you know, we can think purely from the land induced flow. Yes, yes, okay, yes. Okay, thank you. So why do we have this? Now, let's look at the beta gyres. So this is, so we are, now the two, uh, the plots on the left and the right are exactly the same because we're now plotting the beta gyres. So the streamline now shows just the beta gyres, okay? But the, the pink still shows the, uh, the orientation of the coastline. So this is uh, east-west and this is north-south. Now, because of the orientation of the coastline, so on the, for the east-west oriented coastline, you will now have an onshore flow here and an offshore flow like that, right? So, so uh, when the tropical cyclone is making close to landfall on an east-west coastline, you have a large area where you have an onshore flow, but the offshore flow is only very small, okay? On the other hand, if you have a north-south coastline, the orientation of the offshore flow and the onshore flow will be different relative to the storm, all right? So in, to this, a storm moving like that with an east-west coastline, it is ahead, the onshore flow is ahead of the tropical cyclone and the offshore flow is behind. On the other hand, if you have a tropical cyclone moving in the east-west, uh, sorry, uh, in the north-south coastline, although the tropical cyclone is moving towards here, because remember uh, the um, so, sorry, the, be, because the tropical cyclone is moving towards like that, then the location where you have the offshore flow and the onshore flow will be different. And as a result of that, you will then generate the so the combination of the, the so the, the, the because of the uh, difference in terms of where you have the onshore flow. Remember the mechanism of this is very simple. When you have onshore flow, 
then you have convergence, rising motion, and therefore you develop this uh, condensation heating and also the gyres, right? Uh, so where you have the onshore flow becomes very important. If you have a, uh, the location of the onshore flow determines um, the location or, or determines the orientation of the, um, of the, of the pair of gyres. And so when you, when you now have the uh, induced flow, uh, land induced flow superimposed, when the, when the beta gyres are superimposed on the, on the, um, uh, on the land induced flow, then you would then have a, a different orientation of the gyres as what you see in here. Okay, so, so this is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it was, I, I'm wrong. So, so this is actually the total flow um, adding the beta gyres plus the, the, uh, the, the land induced flow. So therefore you will have a, let me see whether I'm correct or not. Um, No, uh, uh, the, the, uh, I think this is just the, the land induced flow because the, the, the gyres will be like that. Okay, so, so uh, because of the, uh, if I remember right, this is actually the land induced flow. I, 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 sh I think it is right. So therefore you would, there's a deviation um, to the, to the right, and there's a deviation more to the left in here. So this is subtracting the beta gyre effect. Yeah. So, so beta, but the basic idea is that when you have a, when you have a, um, when you have the, uh, the beta gyres superimposed on the land friction, then the location of the onshore versus the offshore uh, area is different. And that therefore generates and therefore that causes the change in the orientation of the, uh, the pair of gyres. And that's what causes the tropical cyclone to move differently in the case of a east-west versus a north-south oriented coastline. Okay. All right. So, um, sorry, a bit of the confusion in here. So any questions? Okay, now the third, the third part is that, as I mentioned, that you will need to think about the, um, the flat terrain with varying friction. Now I go back to F plane because uh, that makes it understanding easier. Uh, otherwise you will not, you will then have to think about the, the, the beta effect again. So we did two experiments in here. Um, this is a, let's say if you have a, if you have a, a river delta, so this is again, uh, land. Okay. And so, um, the, the control experiment is in black like that. Now, if you now take away this delta, what does that mean? That means in this area, the surface roughness is the same as the ocean. So only this part, okay? So the rest of it is rough land in here. And you now what you see is that the, uh, these other three experiments, they all show, now except for the, uh, so they all show that um, there is a deviation. So, so that means when you have a, a change in the roughness of a delta, then there is a track change associated with this. And we have, I'm not going to show too much of that, but you can, we actually see that that's again, because you change the, the heating, because here you can see that there is a lot more moisture. So therefore the heating becomes a lot more in this area. And therefore it changes the direction of the motion. So the heating is important in causing the track deviation when you have a, a river delta in here. In fact, you can see that there's a, a deviation like that of about 20 kilometers. Oops, the, the direction is, the, the, the vector is wrong. Okay, uh, 
again, and another very interesting study is I said about varying friction. So instead of a del river delta, we modify the land surface roughness. So here is a uh, both of both cases have um, no south oriented coastline, but because it's an F plane, it really doesn't matter whether it's east west or north south. Okay. But what's important in here is that on the left hand side, the panel is that you have a, even though both uh, parts in here are rough, rougher than over the ocean, but this part here with the dark shading is even rougher than this one here. So we say this is north rough and south smooth. So, so this land is very rough. This land is rough. This is smooth, okay? So that's how we distinguish. On the right-hand side, this land is rough and the southern side is very rough, okay? So you can imagine that you have a, you have a city here and then you have the rural area in here. But then in here, you have a rural area here and a city over here. Right, obviously city will have a much uh, larger roughness. So what you see in these two experiments is that when you have a very rough land to the north, so this is the control with the same, uh, so these two are exactly the same with the same, only to the uh, equal roughness, and that's what you see in the right red. Now, if you have an increased roughness to the north, then the track is now again deviates towards this land where it's very rough. Okay. Now, if you have a rough land to the south, then again it deviates more uh, on this side. In fact, so much so that this one really doesn't make landfall. Okay. So even after eight days, so this track uh, makes landfall in seven days, where if you have an equal roughness, but if you have a very rough land on the south, then there's a deviation here, and the track, uh, the, the, the vortex never makes landfall. So in other words, what you see in here is that the, the rougher land, therefore seems to uh, caught, in some sense, attract the, 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 the travel cyclone to such an extent that in some cases you might not even make landfall. Now, I don't want to go into the details of that, but basically it's the same concept that roughness brings changes in the convergence, that changes the convection, therefore changes the PV tendency, and therefore changes the track. Okay, so the summary then is an inherent, there is a Whenever you have a discontinuity <coughs> in the surface friction, there is an inherent vortex motion. Okay, so that's that's important. Now, tip motion is caused by two main processes. One is that the development of a ventilation flow associated with vortex tear through the generation of relative vorticity from the divergence term in the vorticity equation, and then there is also the diabetic heating due to differential convergence. So these are the two important mechanisms that will cause the uh, a vortex to move towards land. Now, uh, such an inherent motion modifies the beta effect so that different coastline orientation will cause the track to deviate differently. And also differential friction over land will cause track deviations towards rougher land. Okay, now, so, Maybe there's a one question that I can expect from you guys is, can we observe this in real in the real atmosphere? Okay, so we try to do this, but the problem is that in uh, when you have a, a real tropical cyclone that's moving towards land and making landfall, it is very difficult to separate the steering flow from the uh, this effect. So we, we try to do this for many, many cases and we, we, we could find something, but this uh, because of the uh, 
the, the uncertainties and the of the position of the track itself, and also because of the data uncertainties and so on. Uh, we couldn't find that deviation to be statistically significant. So that's 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 one of the difficulties. So what we're now trying to do is to look at cases where the steering flow, that means the background flow, is relatively weak. So in that case, then this um, the steering component may be not as strong, and then we may be able to see this type of deviation. So um, so before you ask the question about whether we see this as an observation, I'll tell you that we've tried, but not very successful. And we'll continue to, to understand this because I think that's very important in terms of looking at the track prediction uh, near landfall. Okay, so let me just stop here for a minute. And uh, I, I have concluded part on the surface friction. So, so uh, please, if you have any questions, so we can talk about this now. Okay, thank you very much. Any question or comment? So no just questions? follow up question of Nino Sensei. I I think um, I'd like to know the relationship between the convergence and divergence and the gyres. So I think oh simply, you know, convergence and divergence makes the two gyres. Is it okay to say it again? Uh, okay. So you mentioned, you know, the contrast here, uh, we see the, you know, contrast of convergence and divergence, right? Yes. So I think it generates the gyres, a pair of gyres. Yes. Okay. So uh, I think the important thing is, you know, the uh, orientation of the gyres, right? Yes. O orientation of the pair of gyres, but still I'm not quite understood uh, about, you know, how this orientation is determined. Okay. So, so uh, it's kind of like the, the concept that we have talked about in the beta gyres. You start out generating the, the, the gyres for, so for example, in the beta gyre case, you have a east-west orientation of the gyres, right? But then the tangential wind rotates it, okay? So the tangential wind is the one that, so it's the symmetric election of the asymmetric vorticity that, that causes this rotation. And so similarly, in the case of the friction, uh, differential friction, you still, you also generate this pair of gyres, but then the tangential wind associated with the tropical cyclone then rotates this gyre, this pair of gyres, and there is a equilibrium configuration. It's kind of like in the beta gyre case that the, these two um, mechanisms, the generation of the um, vorticity uh, producing the gyres uh, balances the rotation due to the asymmetric advection so that the orientation becomes relatively uh, stable. So you have a kind of like an equilibrium configuration, just like in the case of the beta gyre. So the nonlinearity, uh, when you solve the equation, is that it will then cause an equilibrium configuration to be so that the, um, the pair of gyres sits in that location. So I think that's how it works. So um, you can, we, we have looked at the, the evolution of these pair of gyres and, and it starts to stabilize after about two days, two, three days. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question? I ask you a question? Yes, please. I still do not understand why the vortex pair, gyre, vortex gyres are located like showing slide in page 16 in the west east to west coastline cases yeah why is gyres are located like this in the east west coastline case i understand the combination of the friction and the mid gyre is it obvious that the, 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 the reason is like this? The reason why the orientation is different, as I said, 
um, is because the beta gyres themselves. So, so, so first of all, so there are two. Now, um, okay. So, so. Uh, um, okay. Let me see if I can. Um, I think we can do some annotation in here. Okay. Uh, so, so first of all, you can see in here that you have. Um, wait. Let me let me stop first. So um, let's look at this first. So this is the onshore flow and offshore flow associated with the beta gyres. So, okay, so both cases, yes. yeah, the beta gyres. So that's, that's yeah. easy to understand, right? Yeah. Now, so let's superimpose that off on the, on the, um, So now, when you have uh, a vortex like this, so here, now you have the vortex circulation like this, right? Yeah. So now, what you have, so this, um, so you have the cyclone circulation like that. Yes. So on the, on this side, so you have uh, onshore flow, okay? Yes, okay. And so in other words, now you have an onshore flow. So this is um, onshore. Due to the, due to the, uh, the friction. Yes. Okay. Now, on this side, you have the offshore. Change. So on this side, you have now offshore, right? Yes. So it's the combination. So it's the combination of the onshore flow and the offshore flow uh, due to these two processes that will modify the gyres. Now, on the other hand, in here, if you draw it again, uh, because the Now the this this tropical cyclone is like this. Yes. So therefore the onshore flow uh, will be here. Yes. So now you have so you have the onshore flow. Uh, the two onshore flow are in the same location. Yes. The two offshore flow will also be very similar in the same location, right? Yeah, yeah. But here, the onshore flow and the offshore flow of the two com two processes are just exactly the opposite. Yeah. And because of that, then the uh, the location where the gyres form will therefore be different. I think that's what the reason is because where you have the when you superimpose these two types of flows that the the net the location where the net onshore flow occurs versus that where the net offshore flow occurs are different. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's where why the the difference in terms of the uh, that's why you see uh, the difference in here. Yes. So I wonder why the results of the the two different flow is the right figure of this slide. Sorry, what? This one here. 
maybe the maybe the, in the previous slide yeah the right figure is the result of the combination of two flows due to the beta gyre and the dc main saturation right uh yeah this is the but right this figure. is the sorry say it again so that the right figure in this slide is a result of the combination of two flows the friction and i'm sorry due to the bed gyres and the tc main saturation um no this is the uh after you subtract the beta gyres ah sorry after you subtract the beta gyres because if you if you include the beta gyres you will you will you will then have have uh, much uh, you will have a, a cyclonic flow here and uh, and an anticyclonic flow over here so this is after you you subtract the the beta gyres Yes, and I mean, what to say, what to say. Okay, so let's talk about this later. Let me, give me a time to think about that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, all right. Okay, any other question? Okay, Nino Sensei, please. Yes. Um, in your wet rough land experiment, yes. um, how the intensity of the tropical cyclone changes? Ah, that's a good question. Um, mm. I don't think we we looked at the intensity uh -huh. uh, at I all. Yeah. yeah, because you 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 showed that uh, rough roughness attracts tropical cyclones so that's uh, quite interesting but uh, I, I i'm curious if uh, you know tropical cyclone is weakened due to roughness then it, it, it's very you know <laughs> um maybe tropical cyclones don't like to <laughs> to be weakened so so <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, it's possible. Uh, maybe, <laughs> but I think at that time we were only uh, uh -huh. we were only interested in um, in looking at the at the the track. So we mm. we didn't focus on the intensity. But that's a very interesting question. Uh -huh. um, um, there could be some intensity change. Yes. Mm. Uh, okay. e excuse me. Uh, the do you mention about the one the chain two thousand six? Uh, the yes. figure to indicate the temporal evolution of central pressure. In, yeah, in, in, in. I saw that you have the, put it on the, uh, on the uh, website. So yeah, uh, I <laughs> honestly I forgot what I. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a very intense tropical cyclone. There are no significant we couldn't do. After the long was mm -hmm. maybe we should uh, look into in detail, but uh, we can see a lot of detailed things uh, mm. in this paper. Very interesting paper. We should read this. Out. Okay, thank you. Yes, please please uh, read it and uh, send me comments later on. I would be happy to. Uh, I mean, this is something like what uh, Ito san was saying yesterday. Is that uh, the, the problem of track, um, the mechanism for track uh, has been kind of ignored in the last 10 years or so. So we, maybe this will be a good thing to, to start working more on this problem. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, uh, Kanada-san. You're welcome. Right, so shall we go on? Yes, please. Okay, so what I like to do in the second part, uh, um, we have already started, uh, 
about an hour and, and 10 minutes. So um, should we continue? Because this part is going to take quite some time. Um, or do you want to take a, a break now, uh, ito -san. Well, anyway, it's fine. But one possibility is you can take a short break here, and then you can talk about the topography effect. And then you can take another break. You know, fifteen minutes break or so. Yeah, why, why don't we do this? Uh, uh, because I think this one will take a, maybe about uh, close to an hour. Okay. So, so maybe we'll take a fifteen minute break instead of yeah. half an hour like, like yesterday. So, so now it's uh, ten after three your time. Mm -hmm. So let's come back at uh, twenty five after three. Okay, that's fine. So okay. we will do the lecture uh, three twenty five in Japanese time. Okay, yeah. so we have a break of 10, uh, 15 minutes. Okay. okay, all right, thank you. Okay, so yeah, meantime, maybe people can uh, discuss about anything, you know, if you want, or uh, if you have any questions, you can submit our, your comment into the chat or directly send me the message. Anything is okay, okay. So Nino, since they asked about intensity, so this is the uh, intensity of the, the experiment. So the solid line is the uh, wet case. Uh, and then the dashed line is the uh, dry case. So yes, you're right that when you have a dry, in a dry experiment, that the intensity, uh, the, the tropical cyclone weakens quite significantly. So that's uh, uh, how that answered your question and actually uh, Kanada san already given you the uh, given you the the link for this paper now the other question that uh, ito san asked about the evolution of the gyres so actually we have a uh, this um uh shows the every day what the gyre looks like so in the beginning as i said there's no no gyre so there's only divergence in here uh but then as you go to uh, 40, 46 to 72 hours, you start to see this pair of gyres develop. So it's a little bit here, but the gyres becomes more apparent at the, in 72 to 86, uh, 96 hours in here. And as I said, this pair of gyres then starts to rotate by the tangential wind. And so therefore it actually, and, and at that time, the, because the tropical cyclone is now very close to land, the tangential wind becomes much larger. So therefore the rotation becomes more significant. So you can see uh, by 96 hours in here and 120 hours that it has rotated uh, a lot more than compared with like uh, after only one to two days. So if you compare this one with this one, you can see that the, the there's a, a very strong rotation in that case. Okay, so that's, that's uh, the, now the question about the convert the, the, why the, the gyres are different in the two orientate or um, for the beta effect case. So I, I, I mentioned about the convergence difference. And so this is the plot of the asymmetric convergence between the east-west oriented coastline versus the north-south oriented coastline. So as I mentioned, because of the overlap of the two uh, processes, you will now have the convergence uh, in this location uh, I think the shade that is the um, uh, divergence. Um, so, so here you have uh, divergence in here and not much convergence, whereas in here you have, uh, sorry, the, uh, the other way around, shade that is convergence. So now the convergence is on this side, divergence here, but then in north-south here, you will have uh, divergence in here and strong convergence in here. So therefore, the, because the change of the location of the net convergence and divergence, then it will lead to a different uh, uh, formation of the gyres and therefore the formation of the heating. So I hope that answers some of the questions. And if you like, you can also, so this paper uh, is published in, uh, in Advances in Atmospheric Science. Uh, if, so you can take a look at that. Okay, um, so let me just um, go to the, so let me stop share this one here. Oh, I think another, we, I got uh, another question from Nino Sensei. Oh, okay. So, Please. 
yeah, he said that if there is no steering flow, I would think that tropical cyclone don't like to approach land where no supply of water vapor exists. So it is very cu curious result that dynamical effect due to the surface roughness overcome some dynamic effects and yeah. tropical cyclones toward land. I agree. In fact, when we first made this, ran this experiment, I asked my student, are you sure that the results are wrong, are they correct, with it, or is that a numerical problem? <laughs> so, so, uh, so obviously it's not a numerical uh, error, and you can actually see that, yes, the dynamical effects are actually more important than the thermodynamic effects. Yes, I think that's, that's the main message. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> So yeah, I think this is one reason why, you know, tropical cyclone track studies are very difficult. You know, uh, our convergence, divergence, uh, you know, generates the heating source, but later on it generates the large scale uh, circulations. And so diabetic heating makes many kinds of contributions and things are very complex. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it makes a study of the track very interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so let, let, let me continue. Um, so the second part of this uh, uh, talk is about the effect of topography. Uh, and so I would more mainly focus on, um, on Taiwan, but I will also show some results for the Philippines. So in our area, the two main topographic regions will be Taiwan and, uh, and the Philippines. And of course, in Japan, you have that, but by the time it goes to Japan, um, and, and, and the effect of topography will probably be, may not be as significant, but I mean, that will be interesting to study. I haven't done any stuff. I don't, I don't know if anybody has done some studies on this, but uh, you might um, let me know if I'm, if I'm wrong. So, um, so let's just look at the, some observation studies. So here's Taiwan Island, and these are some of the tracks uh, uh, f f f moving from the east. And you can see that in some case, it, when they when the tracks pass to the southern part of Taiwan, uh, there is not much change in the track. Okay. However, when it's go, uh, so this is the central mountain range in Taiwan. However, if the storms are moving to the north, northern part of Taiwan Island, then many times it goes, it turns to the, before it hits Taiwan, it actually turns north and then comes, uh, goes over the mountain and then turns like that. So there are some strange effects uh, that uh, the central mountain range has on the track of the tropical cyclone. So this has been noticed for many years. And so I use this reference because they plotted out this uh, in a much nicer way. So obviously this track was um, done many years ago, as you can see the tracks are actually in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, also with the uh, better observations from radar, uh, people actually have noticed not only the deviation that you saw in here, you also, they also see loops. Okay, so, so in, when the tropical cyclone makes close to landfall, so uh, this is closer, it's obvious that uh, if it doesn't make landfall directly, but makes a loop like this, and then it goes uh, to the north. And another one, Hai Tang, in 2005, also did a very similar thing. Before it made landfall, it made another loop. But this time it goes across the mountain, central mountain range and make landfall like that. So, so these are uh, very prominent effects that people have uh, identified when a tropical cyclone is about to make landfall over Taiwan. And that makes forecasting very difficult, uh, not only on the track, but also on the rainfall. Okay, so these are some of the observations. And so the, uh, the question is, what causes that to occur, All right? So there have been quite a number of modeling studies and I'll show some of those. Um, uh, 
Ho in 2001 made a very simple study with a barotropic vortex and put an elliptic mountain in the model. And so uh, they study uh, for different types of intensity. So this is the different intensity, uh, uh, maximum intensity of the tropical cyclone. And you see that, um, it, so the cross is, the, is where it starts, okay? And then you can see that actually it rotates around like this. It, it goes around the mountain. It goes around the mountain like that. And the, the more intense uh, storm, the more loops that it can go before it get out of the mountain, okay? So, uh, and they also change the height of the mountain. Now, central mountain range has the highest peak of about 3,000, uh, of about three kilometers, okay? Um, and so they, they said, okay, well, what if you have a, a shallower mountain versus a very high mountain? And so you see that although they still, there are still these loops in the air like that, they look very differently when you have different heights of the mountain. So in other words, um, you have the two things now is that when you have an elliptic mountain, then you have this loop, but at the same time, the how fast it loops around the mountain depends on how high the mountain is. So the reason for this rotation is because the mountain changes the equivalent depth of the fluid and hence changes the equivalent rotation of the earth. It's kind of like the, what people have called that as a topographic beta effect. In fact, uh, in some water tank experiments, um, if you, I mean, some of you might have heard about these water tank experiments where they put a water tank that rotates. So that simulates uh, the earth rotation. And then they put a, a, a mountain there and then see how the vortex goes around the mountain. And, and so that's uh, uh, what's called a, a topographic beta effect. So uh, Cole actually mentioned that the motion of vortex is therefore to conserve potential vorticity. And so uh, because of the, uh, so, so therefore this depends on the height of the mountain. Oh, sorry, H is the maximum height of the mountain. And this is the equivalent depth of the, of the, of the fluid. And, uh, and, and A0 is the width of the mountain. So they, they, you can actually do some calculations of that and then get the, and, and, and show that the, these results are simply because you have a fluid uh, and a vortex. So you have a, um, the, the, the topographic, the topography actually uh, show uh, uh, in effect uh, creates a beta plane, okay? Because the equivalent depth is different, okay? Now, so, so basically uh, that's one experiment. Another experiment that uh, Ye and Ellsbury did in 1993 was that again, they put an elliptical mountain in here and then they put uh, the vortex at different locations relative to the, to the, to the mountain. And so what you see here is uh, very similar to what uh, the observation is when, it, they are, when the storm is moving to the south of the mountain so that the, the thin lines are without the mountains. The thick lines are with the mountains, with the mountain. And so what you see here is that uh, when there's, uh, when, when the storm is moving to the south of the mountain, then the deviation is not very significant. However, um, as it moves further to the north, then you have a much more deviation, very much like that of the, um, very much like that of the, uh, from the observations. Okay, so, uh, and then in Jan and Wu, um, they did a simulation here and they were able to simulate the rotation. So here is a control experiment. Uh, and the uh, best track is in the star. So this is the best track for, uh, I forgot which storm is. So this is the, So, so this is the, um, the loop that I showed you before. So I think this is actually high tank in 2005. 
So if you run the experiment in a control experiment, you can you can uh, also see a loop like this, right? But without the mountain, NT means no Taiwan, no mountain, no topography. Then the track just continues going to the northwest. So therefore, the mountain obviously produces this loop in here. So they asked the question, they, they, they pr proposed the reason why you have this um, uh, loop, this southward deviation is because um, in the, the, the winds in the control experiment shows that there, uh, um, it doesn't show very well the, uh, where the, the mountain is, but, but on, the, on the Western side, you have a very strong wind compared with that on the, on the Eastern side. You can see in here that there's very strong wind in here, uh, over 50 meters per second. Okay, and so uh, what they propose is that if you subtract, but of course part of that uh, strong wind is due to the um, the tropical cyclone itself. So therefore, if you subtract the symmetric component of the wind, you will see that uh, there is actually a a north um, northeasterly flow in this direction, so uh, such that it actually pushes the vortex towards the Southwest. So what they think is that the reason for a, what they propose is that the reason for a, a for, this, for this deviation is because the mountain actually forces the winds to be uh, confined just east of the mountain so that as a result, you will have a very strong wind pushing towards the southwest and therefore causing the loop that you saw in the in the in the um, in the observations. So one of the mechanisms that have been proposed for this uh, loop is that when the tropical cyclone close close to the mountain, then what happens is that you, the tropical cyclone is squeezed near that mountain, and so therefore there is a very strong wind uh, pushing towards the south. So it's kind of like a channeling effect that forces all the wind pushing towards the south, and as a result of that that the vortex is being pushed towards the south. Then as it, it moves towards the south, then it comes around and then it, it hits Taiwan. So that's one mechanism that had been proposed. Uh, but very recently we did another study and um, not in a real case, but a, a, a idealized simulation where you put a, uh, uh, um, the Taiwan topography like this, okay? And then, um, this is the track without any terrain, as we would expect the beta effect. So there, you put a vortex in here and just let it run under the beta effect, then it will be it will move like that. Now, when you put in the, the mountain like this, then at about 60 hours, uh, the first 60 hours is the same because it's still very far away from the mountain. Then after 60 hours, it starts to deviate towards the north as what you would expect from the observations. Then as it gets close to the mountain, then it, it hits the mountain and then it goes like that, all right? So we wanna understand a little bit more about what is causing this. Uh, and so what we did is we look at the asymmetric flow again. Uh, this is with Taiwan topography minus without. So this is not just the asymmetric flow, but the difference between two experiments the one with topography and the one without topography. And the white uh, outline here is the Taiwan Island, okay? So, and this is where the tropical cyclone is. Now, all the plots later on will be relative to this point. So you will see that the, the flow changes around the tropical cyclone. So it's relative to the tropical cyclone. So the zero, zero doesn't change. So it's only the location of Taiwan relative to the storm will change. All right, so the shading indicates the wind speed. And so what you see here is that this is at 26 to, uh, sorry, 24 to 36 hours average. And at that time, uh, the storm is still about 500 kilometers from the, from the mountain. And already uh, because uh, uh, of the mountain, um, you already start developing a pair of gyres. So there's a cyclonic gyre, and then the cyclonic gyre, 
And now, of course, I'll explain what causes the formation of this, but let's look at the evolution of this pair of gyres first, okay? So, so let's move on. So this is, this is uh, now the, the time is uh, indicated on the right, lower right-hand corner. So this is 24 to 36 hours, 36 to 48. So remember I said that the, 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 the island is moving towards the, the storm. Relatively speaking, so we are all we plotting everything relative to the center of the storm. So what you see here is that the cycle, the the pair of gyres starts to evolve, like that, and then it, it starts to rotate, uh, going around like that. And by the time of sixty to seventy, I remember we said that that's that's when it starts to deviate, right? So so now it starts to deviate. The solid line is the is the direction with topography and the dash line is without topography. So now you can start you seeing that there's a bit of a deflection towards the north. And now it, you can see, you can start seeing a flow uh, from the southwest, okay? So this is uh, 60 to 72 hours. Uh, by 72 to 84 hours, um, you will see that a very strong southerly flow. So the flow is quite significant. It's about five meters per second. Okay, so it actually pushes the, the vortex towards the north. Now, so, the, so again, remember the rotation here. Now, so I start from here, it starts to rotate, rotate like that. And it continues the rotation. And then the, 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 the tropical cyclone moves towards the, the north. And then uh, in, uh, from 96 to 108 hours, then it, the, the orientation of the gyres are like this, so that the storm now is being pushed towards Taiwan. And then finally, uh, the, the orientation of the gyre actually reverses with the anticyclonic flow here and the cyclonic flow here. Okay? So, so then the... What you see from this um, series of uh, charts is that you can see that the uh, this when the tropical cyclone is still quite far away from the storm, you already form this pair of gyres like this, and this pair of gyres starts to rotate uh, because of the tangential wind of the tropical cyclone, and as the tropical cyclone gets closer, the tangential winds become stronger. And also, uh, there are other mechanisms for the for this gyre, which I'll talk about in a minute. So you have um, this pair of counter-rotating gyres and pushing the storm towards the north, and then uh, afterwards, it it it, it uh, finally the storm moves across uh, to the other side of Taiwan. Okay, so this is the what you you can see from the. The, the, the numerical simulations. So now let's go try to understand why you have the formation of these gyres. All right. So the, uh, the light lines in here are the topo is the topography. The solid line you see here is the uh, coastline of Taiwan. Okay. And the shading is the potential vorticity. Uh, so what you see here is that to the um, on the on the um, and, and also that the the the, uh, the, the, the arrows indicate the, the streamline flow, um, and and so what you see here is that um, the this is uh, I forgot what time it is now. Uh, I think this is about um, uh, two uh, three days or so. So what you see here is that because of the, the mountain itself, then there is actually a negative PV on the upwind side of the mountain. And then the, on the downwind side of the mountain, you have a positive, uh, sorry, uh, just the reverse. So, so you have the air coming up the mountain, so therefore the vortex is being stretched. So therefore you have a cyclonic uh, vorticity in here. And then in here, because it's, it's going down, 
going down here. So therefore, it's the, 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 the vortex tube is being squished. So therefore, you have a negative PV in here, right? Now, so uh, if you look at the uh, PV tendency, um, this is the, um, again, the uh, terms in the PV tendency equation with topography minus without topography. Okay, so the, um, of course, the horizontal advection is very important. So this is, uh, the red line is the landfall time. The, dash, the, the blue dash line is the leaving Taiwan. And then this is landfall in, in China mainland. So let's focus on this part here. So what you see is that uh, as the tropical cyclone moves closer to the land, there's a strong horizontal advection term which then pushes the storm. So the vector is pointing towards the north. So therefore the storm is being pushed towards the north, but then it starts to point towards the northwest, right? So uh, the, the, uh, um, the contribution of horizontal advection is to push it to the north and then push it to the west. However, now the vertical advection term is generally uh, much smaller. So let's not worry too much about this. But the diabetic heating term also starts to be very important about 72 hours. And this diabetic heating term is pointing towards the south, right? So as a result, when you combine this term and the diabetic heating term, then the, the total potential vorticity tendency is pointing towards the north in the beginning and then pointing towards the uh, southwest uh, later on. So therefore, it starts to move to the north and then pointing, going back towards Taiwan. Okay, so that's, that's uh, again, you can see that to, to explain the motion, you need to look at both the horizontal action and the diabetic heating. All right, so the question is, why do we have this mechanism going on? So this is a kind of a complicated diagram, but I will explain uh, bit by bit as we move on. So, we propose that there are actually three mechanisms. Uh, one is that there is dry air from the mountain. And there's a second mechanism is the mountain altered wind field. Of course, the mountain will change the wind field. And then the third mechanism is the uh, swinging of the convergence on the downstream side of the mountain. So I'll explain each of these as we move on. So remember this diagram. And we'll come back to this diagram as we move on. So first of all, let's look at, so we, we want to look at the dry air from the mountain. So let's look at the, the water mixing ratio, uh, water vapor mixing ratio. Um, again, this is the difference between the two experiments. So what you see here is that at 65 hours into the, into the integration, you will see that because of the, um, the air flowing over the mountain, so therefore there is a lot of drying on the lee side of the mountain like that, right? So this is very much drying. So therefore the, the drying of the mountain uh, would therefore lead to, uh, the sinking motion would therefore lead to asymmetric vertical motion. And the divergence. So this is the uh, Taiwan uh, island in here. So this is the, the thin line is the topography. So this is the tropical cyclone in here, right? So if you calculate the convergence and divergence, and um, you will see that uh, because of the flow over the mountain, you actually have, uh, and together with the storm uh, like that, so then you will have an asymmetric convergence, uh, convergence and divergence in here, where you have divergence in here uh, in, the, in the white, and then strong convergence, of course, near the center, but more, in, so this part here, you don't need to worry too much because that's just the tropical cyclone circulation. But what's important is this uh, convergence in this part here, okay? So this convergence is the, so this is a swirling inward of the convergence on the downstream side of the mountain. So the, together with the mountain auto wind field, then it, it changes the asymmetric divergence within the boundary layer. So the asymmetric convergence divergence together with the vertical motion 
which you can see in here. So this is the vertical motion. Now, the, the plot is a bit difficult to, to understand, but let me explain this a little bit. So again, you have a tropical cyclone like this, so you unwrap it, okay? So open it up, open the cylinder up. And so therefore this is the east side, south side, western side, northern side, and eastern side of the, of the uh, uh, tropical cyclone. And this is average within, uh, I think it's three degrees of the tropical cyclone center. So this is the time. And so what you see here is that the, uh, the vertical motion is in uh, is W, not omega. So this is in meter per second. So positive means the rise in motion. So you can see that the, 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 as the tropical cyclone moves closer to land, so this is landfall time. And so as the tropical cyclone moves towards the land, the strongest rising motion is in the southwestern part. Okay. So therefore, you will now have a asymmetric vertical motion, which is contributed by the asymmetric divergence within the boundary layer. So you have a rising motion in here. And this rising motion, therefore, will lead to an asymmetric advection of uh, water vapor. And as you can see, the same thing. There's a, the largest uh, advection of water vapor is in the southwestern part which is what you would expect. Then, obviously, when you have vertical advection of water vapor, you will then have the condensational heating. And so the maximum heating, again, is in this area where you have the maximum heating. And when you have maximum heating, you will then lead to a uh, vertical gradient of the heating rate and therefore leads to a diabetic heating. So in other words, what you're seeing here, let me go back to this diagram in here. So so the mechanism is quite complicated. So you have because you have the mountain, right? So you have the mountain. So there are things, lots of things are happening. So you have the air open over the mountain and sinks. So therefore, it, it causes uh, a sinking motion and then you have the divergence first, but then the divergence then goes into the tropical cyclone. At the same time, you will have this, the, the uh, swirling inward of the convergence. So the, 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 the divergence then becomes the convergence swinging into the storm, okay? And then these then leads to all these subsequent changes in terms of the um, vertical advection, condensation heating, and the, and the vertical gradient of the heating rate. Remember, the diabetic heating term is a very strong, uh, 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 is a very important term, which is the, the divergence multiplied by the vertical gradient of heating. So therefore, this is the term that contributes towards the heating and therefore the diabetic heating. Now, so the, um, So if you go back to this one here, and therefore, the reason why you have a strong diabetic heating in here and to the south southwestern part, remember I show you that the southwestern part is where you have the strongest diabetic heating. This diabetic heating is because of the mountain causing the asymmetric uh, convergence and subsequent asymmetric and the condensational heating and therefore the diabetic heating. So if you only have the horizontal advection, right? That's what we people have shown is that you have this um, channeling effect and so on. You can only explain the dynamical aspects of it, the, the, the advection part, but you cannot explain the motion without considering the diabetic heating. So again, it's very important that you need to look at the diabetic heating uh, associated with this uh, mountain effect. So you have both the dynamical effect and the thermodynamic effect, but the dynamic effect of the mountain actually drives the con convergence, which then drives the condensation. Okay, so these two are not independent. 
they actually they actually work together to cause the tropical cyclone to move. All right. So I want to go uh, to here. Now we want to say, okay, if if the mountain really does have this um, mechanism, what about other mountains? So we did another study to look at <coughs> uh, the island of Luzon. Okay, so again, yeah, this is the island of Luzon with the topography shaded. So we ran two experiments. One is the uh, solid, the black line is no terrain. And then the, the red is with terrain. Again, you can see that by the, so, so this is the coastline of the Luzon Island, okay? So you have the mountain here, a little bit of a mountain, but the main mountain is on the Western side. So again, before the, about 36 hours before landfall, then the tropical cyclone starts to deviate. And then after crossing the mountain, then it merges with the one without terrain, okay? So what about the uh, asymmetric flow? So again, this is the asymmetric flow with Luzon topography minus without. So what you see again, so uh, the, 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 the white contour is the um, island of Luzon. This is the center of the tropical cyclone. Uh, and again, we are moving the island towards the uh, tropical cyclone to be e to easier for, for us to, to see the, the evolution much easier. So the time is on the uh, lower right-hand corner. So this is 12 to 24 hours, um, 26, 24 to 36 hours. Now you begin to see this cyclonic gyre very similar to that of the um, uh, 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 case of Taiwan. And so now you have the gyres in here forming like that. And so at this time, the tropical cyclone starts to deviate uh, towards the, the, the north uh, compared with the case without topography. So because of the steering, pushing the storm like that. And then the rotate, the, again, the, the cyclonic and the anti-cyclonic rotation uh, that the pair of gyres starts to, starts to rotate. And so by uh, 44 to 56 hours, the rotation is like this. And and then afterwards, the uh, orientation of the gyres actually reverse, where you have anti-cyclonic here and then cyclonic flow in here, okay? So it's very similar. If you compare the two, you see that when you have a topography, so on the left-hand side is Luzon Island, on the right-hand side is Taiwan Island. And so you can see that in both cases, because of the, uh, the cyclonic circulation interacting with the topography, it actually generates a pair of counter-rotating gyres like this. And it's this pair of counter-rotating gyres uh, that causes the, the, the tropical cyclone to deviate towards the north and then uh, away from the storm, uh, away from the Taiwan first. Okay, so that they are very similar. And um, actually we, People have asked this question is, what about a, an island that's in the east-west direction? Instead of, so both Taiwan and Luzon are basically a north-south oriented uh, island, right? So what if you have an island in the east-west direction? We haven't done that. Uh, people in the Atlantic ask the question, so Cuba, the island of Cuba has an east-west orientation. So does that happen? We haven't done that yet. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has done that, but that will be an interesting question to look at. Well, if we imagine the case of Japan, you know, of course, you know, the TC track around Japan is uh, driven by the strong westries, but if we assume there is no wind, it might be a very interesting experience. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of yes. island. Yes. yes, Japan Japan can also, uh, for, for, for the, uh, Long Island of Japan like that, then you could also do a similar uh, 
simulation. I haven't done that yet, but somebody could, could try and see. So, so Japan, in some sense, is an east-west oriented island. So therefore, uh, we can see how that changes in terms of the, or whether the same mechanism actually occurs. So right. we need to, to look at. Yeah, I, I do not know any such kind of idealized simulation result so far, but hmm, anybody knows that kind of studies without West trees when? Maybe not. So it's a chance for many students to run a simulation. <laughs> so it will, it will be a very good master's thesis, thesis at least. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, we did more experiments just for fun to see whether you can get the simulation, uh, uh, get the observational results. So if you if you start out the vortex at different locations. Right, so uh, this is TW10 is starting the vortex at 10 degrees north and so on. So what you see here is that as the, when the tropical cyclone is very far south, then there's not much change. However, as it gets quite close to Taiwan, even though they are not um, exactly uh, near Taiwan, there is still some deviation. Now, recall that that's actually very similar to what Ye and Ellsbury did many years ago. So if you go back to this diagram. So you see that uh, even when the storm is quite far to the south, there is a deviation like this, all right? So the solid line is with topography and the, solid, uh, the thin line is without topography. So there is still a deviation, even though for the whole track, they are still south of the island. Okay, so very similar to what we have found in here. In a, from a, uh, their experiment was actually a biotropic experiment, but this one is a fully biochemic. So you will see that there's this deviation, and and these are all. I don't want to go into the details of the mechanism, but basically, it's still the the generation of the gyres that that changes the um, the track. Um, the size also has some effects. So uh, you can see in here that um, uh, the, 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 the different experiments in here. So R34 is the radius of uh, 34 knot winds. So for a, um, uh, the, these two, uh, the, the red um, experiment is when you have the R34 being very big, so this is a big, big vortex with 600 uh, kilometers in the radius of uh, 34 knots and at starting at 17 degrees north. So it will deviate a lot more. However, if you have a storm that's uh, smaller at, uh, at 15 degrees, you will see that they can, uh, you can still have this deviation. So various size will therefore also give you a, a different deviation of the storm. And so it depends on both the size and as well as the location of the storm. And so there are more experiments that I showed, but I, uh, you can actually go to the different uh, papers to understand the mechanism. But the me basic mechanism is exactly the same, that you have the interaction between the mountain and the surrounding flow that generates the set of gyres which depends on the location of the vortex relative to the, to the, uh, the mountain. And, and so in fact, in this case here, this red, uh, which is uh, medium uh, size vortex at 13.5 latitude, you can see that there's actually a loop that you can generate in here. And similarly for the case of the green, you can also generate a loop like this so um, uh, even with these idealized experiments, you are able, you can actually uh, uh, generate uh, tropical, uh, generate these tracks very similar to those ob observations. And so if you uh, blow up the, the tracks, you can see that uh, when you have a storm a bit further to the north, it doesn't make a loop. It goes to the south, like what I showed you before, 
and then it goes like that. If it's a bit further to the south, then it makes a loop and goes north. And if it's even further to the south, it kind of goes uh, into the mountain without much of a loop. So different locations of landfall, therefore, because of the mountain itself, um, the different locations of landfall can therefore give you a different uh, track uh, and different size of the tropical cyclone will also give you different results. Uh, and this will be for the small tropical cyclones. Okay, so I don't want to go too much into the details yet. So there's a question. Um, oh, good. And then Kurihara. I, I like to have a look at this one sometime. Thank you. So um, the last one I want to show is that what if you have a steering flow? So so in this case we 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 impose an eastward uh, sorry easterly flow over the mountain because all these previous experiments are without any flow. So it's just uh, a vortex, right? But obviously in the real atmosphere, generally speaking, when a tropical cyclone comes to make landfall over Taiwan, there is an easterly flow. So therefore we say, okay, what if you put an easterly flow? Now, if you put an easterly flow, then obviously because of the mountain, so you have the mountain here, so easterly flow coming in, so it will go around the mountain, right? It will go around the mountain and therefore you will see this wake effect. So it's very obvious that you have a wick here, uh, a cyclonic flow, and it goes around the mountain and therefore forms an anticyclonic flow in here. So therefore, in addition to the basic gyres uh, caused by the uh, circulation, the interaction between the circulation of the tropical cyclone with the mountain, you will have an additional uh, pair of gyres due to the wick of the flow over the mountain, okay? So that becomes more complicated. And, and, and so let me just show you a little bit of that. Um, uh, so in the beginning, you will have this wick in here and this then superimposes on the cyclonic flow uh, of, on, the, on, the, on the pair of gyres due to the interaction between this uh, tropical cyclone circulation and the, and the mountain. So this evolution, then changes. And so it will then affect the flow, the asymmetric flow, uh, causing the tropical cyclone to move differently than compared with the case without a steering flow. So, um, uh, so this is the case when you have a steering flow that uh, it will need to move. And then in the, and, and it will depend on the uh, size of the storm as well. So uh, in, in this case, it's a, uh, um, so, sorry, the, the numbers here it actually indicates the uh, magnitude of the, the steering flow. So this is um, five meter per second steering flow. This is 10 meter per second. So what you see here is that when you have 10 meter per second, it pushes the storm so fast that there's no, uh, no interaction. However, for the same storm, if now you only have a five meter per second, then it starts to go, go towards the north, okay? Similarly, when you have these two experiments, one is at 10 meters per second. One is at 10 meters per second, and one is at five meters per second. Again, the weaker steering flow uh, would not so if you have a strong steering flow, it just pushes the storm away, okay? But when you have a weak steering flow, then it will start to move towards the north, towards Taiwan. So in other words, you will now see that um, the, again, uh, when you have a strong steering flow, then the effect of the mountain is not obvious because it just pushes the storm uh, to, the, to the west. But now if you have a weaker steering flow, then the mountain, uh, through its interaction with the tropical cyclone circulation, will then cause the storm to move towards the north. So it's important to look at the um, 
to look at the, the magnitude of the steering flow versus the effect of the interaction. So just to summarize then, is that you have, so we have done many examples in here. So um, this is with no steering flow, five meters per second and 10 meters per second. So if you look at the 10 meters per second, basically there's no interaction, right? So all the movement will be very much towards the Northwest, maybe with a little bit of a deviation, but not very significant. But the weaker steering flow then starts to cause the storms to move a bit towards the north, like this. And if you have a no steering flow, then the movement will be a lot more affected by the, by the, by the interaction between the tropical cyclone circulation and the mountain. So in other words, when you think about forecasting of a tropical cyclone approaching a mountain, you need to look at the size of the storm so because you can see in here, I show you about the large tropical cyclone, medium tropical cyclone, and a small tropical cyclone. And the tracks, will, the deviation will be very different, okay? So a large tropical cyclone, because its interaction uh, uh, starts much earlier, so you have, even when the storm is very far away from the storm, it will still uh, have this effect. Whereas if you have a smaller storm, uh, um, then the effect would, at the same, pretty much the same location, the effect will be very much less. So in other words, you will now have uh, the situation where number one, you need to think about this, the magnitude of the steering flow. And number two, you need to think about the size of the storm. The bigger the storm, the more interaction there will be with the mountain. And as a result, um, these two combined will then give you the track deviation, uh, a, a very different track deviation uh, uh, when, it, when the tropical cyclone approaches the mountain. So just as a summary then, um, we have said that th there's an inherent vortex motion in the presence of discontinuous surface friction as I explained before. So uh, the, so this is the, the first part that I just talked about, but then more importantly is that modification of the flow uh, over the topography can cause the tropical cyclone to change its direction the extent of which depends on the height of the topography, relative location of the cyclone, a relative location of the cyclone to the topography, cyclone size, as well as the magnitude of the background flow. Right, so um, I think that's uh, all I wanna talk about the tropical cyclone motion uh, in terms of topography and uh, surface discontinuity. Okay, so I will stop, I think this is the last slide. Uh, I want to summarize with a, with a schematic diagram. I forgot about this. So just as a summary, when you have a, when you have a surface, a, a land, there are three uh, components that are important. One is you can have uh, roughness difference. You can have topography. You can have moisture distribution. So these are three different uh, modifications as a tropical cyclone approaches land. So we have shown that the roughness difference will get, lead to a convergence or divergence within the boundary layer, which then therefore leads to vertical motion, right? And of course, in the presence of topography, it will also lead to vertical motion. Now these two, the vertical motion together with convergence will then through the vorticity equation will generate the counter rotating gyres that are, that are present in both flat topography and also when you have a mountain topography, right? So this is very important. The generation of asymmetric flow, the counter rotating gyres. Now, of course, the topography can also generate, as I said before. Now, the asymmetric counter rotating gyres will then lead to the horizontal affection of PV, as I shown, have shown you, and that uh, will lead to asymmetric convection and also the counter rotating gyres can also lead to asymmetric convection and diabetic heating. And the counter rotating gyres actually can lead to vertical wind shear, uh, but at the same time, the topography, because of its reduction of the low level flow can also lead to vertical wind shear, okay? And vertical wind shear, of course, as I said yesterday, 
is that it will also lead to asymmetric convection and diabetic heating. And of course, vertical motion will also lead to asymmetric convection. And so would moisture uh, distribution. So all these together will then lead to combining the, uh, uh, the, the horizontal direction of PV together with the asymmetric convection through the PV tendency equation will lead to track deviations and as well as asymmetric rainfall, which uh, we can talk about at, at, at another occasion for the asymmetric rainfall associated with tropical cyclone landfall. All right, so this is basically uh, the mechanism that summarizes everything that I talked about today on the impact of um, land on tropical cyclone track. Right, so uh, I will stop here and then uh, we can have some discussion before we go to the last uh, part on the track forecast errors. Okay, thank you very much. Any question or comments? Okay, so I have one question. Yeah. Okay, so uh, in a previous talk, you uh, assumed, you know, uh, kind of a continent, flat continent, right? 3,000 yeah. kilometer coastal line. How about the, you know, 3,000 kilometer coastal line with topography? Uh, this case is, you know, basically for islands, Taiwan topography, right? Yeah. So do, do you think, you know, any difference, different thing can happen with a such kind of topography? What you mean when you have a high but flat topography? Uh, topography, with topography, but coastal line is uh, 3,000 kilometers. Oh, uh, well, the Taiwan actually it's uh, already 3,000 uh, meters. So it's three kilometers. I don't so, know, 3,000 kilometers, you know, in a, of coastal lines. I, I don't understand your question. Okay. Says. Mm, eto. okay, never mind. Maybe let me try to find good English. A, in, you know, the first topic today. Uh -huh. You assume you know three thousand kilometer coastal line, north south or west east, right? Ah, I see what you say. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. right. Do the same thing uh, for the you know topography. Oh no no no! The, in the in the first part here, even though the domain is very large, mm, but right. the, the tropical cyclone the 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 when uh, it's only when the tropical cyclone is very close to the land. So it's only when the tropical cyclone is like within. 200 kilometers. In fact, mm -hmm. we have tried this. If you put the tropical cyclone like 500 kilometers away from a flat land, nothing happens. Okay. So, 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 so the domain is very large. It just be the reason why we have a 3,000 kilometer domain is because we don't want the boundary conditions because this is periodic boundary conditions in the in the in the model. So we don't want anything on the near the edge of the domain affect what's happening in the center. So the domain is very large, but what you should be focusing on is what, what's within about um, three to 500 kilometers uh, from the center of the, of the domain. So, so you shouldn't be looking at 3000 kilometers, no. Just, no, no, no. What I'd like to assume is that there, you know, uh, something you didn't mention today, just uh, if we, put the continent to the left-hand side of the calculation domain with topography, like uh, not oh, island. I see, I see, I see, I see. So, so let's say if you have uh, like the Rocky Mountains. Right, right, right. Very right. long, long mountain from, right. uh, stretching from, uh, so that the, there's no edge effect of the, of the mountain. Right, right, right. right. So, so here, so, yeah. Yeah. The, you, you, no, we haven't done that. But I think that's interesting because if you have a very long mountain, 3,000 kilometers like this, then the wick effect, uh, if you have an easterly flow, then the wick effect would be very far away from, even if there's a, a, a wick, the wick effect will be very far away from the, 
from the center of the tropical cyclone. So that at that time, there might not be, the effect might not be very um, obvious, but I don't know. I think that it's very interesting. If you have a very long mountain compared with, for example, Taiwan is uh, maybe about 1,000 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's yeah. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's smaller than that. Smaller than that, yes. It's about 500 kilometers, so yeah. So you may be right that if you have a longer mountain, then the effect may not be uh, the same. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Point. Thank you very much. So uh, any other question or comment? Okay, so if no questions, uh, we have uh, another 15 minutes break and uh, and then we will have a last uh, lecture today. Okay, so now for 20 Let, let's take let's take a shorter break, 10 minutes, okay. otherwise we can't finish. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So we, we have our 10 minutes break and we will resume the lecture uh, 430, uh, no, 435. Yeah. Okay. 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 So uh, I like this. Uh, now that you kind of understood uh, something about the um, the mechanisms for tropical cyclone movement um, and how we can interpret the 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 movement based on the uh, potential vorticity perspective. So uh, I, what I want to use the last uh, 45 minutes or so is to talk a little bit about the track forecast errors. So this is uh, a bit different from what we were talking in the last uh, few hours on, the, on more of the mechanisms and physical understanding, but more looking at the forecast themselves and what we can learn from these forecasts, okay? Um, so let's start off by looking at this uh, very simple graph that people have been talking about a long time. So this is the annual mean position error in the Western North Pacific from 1990 to um, from 1990 to 2020. Okay, so uh, obviously we all know that uh, uh, in the last 20 years, even when you can go to a five-day forecast, then there is a significant decrease in the position errors. So, for example, in the 24 hours um, forecast errors, um, in the 1990s, it's roughly about 200 kilometers, okay? Uh, but today, it's about 100. Now, so this two-day 200 kilometers, if you draw a line like this, it's almost uh, like what you have now for 72 hours, not quite, but it's close. So in other words, you have improved significantly in terms of the uh, accuracy of the tropical cyclone forecast errors, right? So um, one reason, of course, is that you have all these ensemble members and they give you very good forecast. So these are the, from the different models, uh, JMA, KMA, and uh, ECMWF, and so on. So you can have this uh, really good forecast and therefore uh, you have a very much improved uh, track forecast. So if you combine everything and then you, you and the blank here is the, is the best track. So you can see that you get a very good forecast, right? Very large ensembles because of the computer power that we have today. The problem is not everything is so nice. So this is the case of, uh, I think this is uh, Typhoon Fital. And you can see that the, they initiate about the same place, but the different ensemble members uh, have very large uh, deviations, okay? So even when people say, ah, ECMWF is really great. And you can see that the different models, uh, different ensemble members have very different forecasts, right? So, if you put them all together, you can 
at the best, this is the best track, but how do you choose which of which group of these ensemble members are best, right? So this is a big problem. So this is one example of a big uh, diverse ensemble spread. There's also another one that's um, that everything is very close, but they're all wrong. So this is the JMA best track hitting uh, Hong Kong, actually. Uh, however, if you look at the different model uh, forecast, so this is the ensemble mean of every model. Okay, so JMA, uh, this is ECMWF and so on. All these models, they all forecast a turning towards Japan. And so when you do the averaging, you get this ensemble mean, which is very far away from the actual track. So in other words, what you see in here is that even though on the average, your forecast errors have decreased substantially in the last 20 years or 30 years, there are still many cases in which either the ensemble members diverge, okay, or different models diverge, or even if the models are very close to each other, the model forecasts are all wrong. Not just one model, but all the models are wrong, as in this case, okay? So, so we need to know a little bit more about this, understand more why this is the case. So that's my comments, is that while the track forecast errors have generally decreased, there are still many cases in which the large model forecast errors exist. They can be in the form of a large spread of the ensemble members or a systematic bias of the ensemble members. Multiple model ensembles can also have large errors, but we, we have seen that some models can perform better in, uh, than others in certain circumstances. So we want to ask the question is, what are the likely causes of such large errors? Okay, either the spread or the systematic bias of all the models. And then more importantly is that if we know the likely causes, can we identify which model is better under different circumstances. So if we can, then for a particular condition, we can say, okay, model A is good, but we can ignore model B and C. So that way then hopefully we can have a, a much better forecast. So let's look at a few of these examples in here. First of all, let's look at intensity. Now we're talking about best track, but best, uh, when you look at the model, they also forecast intensity, right? So if you look at the average, um, we use the JMA best track as the, as the reference for the intensity. So we use the JMA best track minus the forecast for different models. So uh, BOM is Bureau of Meteorology in Australia. This is Canadian, uh, KMA, JMA, NSEP, UK Met Office, ECMWF. Uh, I think this is also Canadian. And so this is French, I think. And then you have this um, uh, China Meteorological Administration. So if you look at all these um, model forecasts for up to uh, five days, uh, this is zero. So as you would expect, all the models have uh, generally weaker tropical cycle. Uh, uh, so the difference means that the best track minus the forecast. So so uh, that means the best track has a, a lower mean sea level pressure, and which means that the forecast could not uh, predict the intensity as observed. So therefore you have the negative values, right? So what you see here is that the negative values can be about you know, 15 to 25 hectopascals. And also you can see that the best or the least uh, the, the, the smallest error is actually uh, from the ECMWF model in here. And the second batch is from, um, from these uh, few models. And then the worst will be the, these last few models. So why do we need to look at intensity forecast? Now, remember yesterday I mentioned that there was a study many years ago that looks at the steering flow layer, right? 
So the, the more intense the storm, um, the more intense the storm, the deeper the steering flow layer that we should be considering. So in here, we're not, uh, so for the rest of the talk, we'll, we'll both mostly focus on the, on the steering part because it would be difficult to look at the, the contribution of the beta effect and the diabetic eating. It's, uh, it's not easy to go back to the, to the, to the model forecast, which we, all, we use the ticket data and to look at the, um, the diabetic eating term. So we will just be basically looking at the, the differences in the steering. So let's look at one example. This is the FNL, which is the uh, uh, final analysis of the NSET uh, data set. So this is Typhoon Nuri, uh, averaging between 300 to 850 hectopascals. So this is the um, tropical cyclone, uh, and this is circulation after removal of the symmetric circulation of the tropical cyclone, okay? So uh, this is what's observed. And this is what the CMA um, model has, a CMA forecast. Okay, so this is the same as the 48 hour forecast in here. And so what you see here is that it's very similar and you have the uh, tropical cyclone here with a steering flow moving towards the China coast like this. However, if you look at the KMA model forecast, same time, and you compare that with the observations, you can see that the, uh, we, we, if you look at the, but now you look at the 500 to 850. The reason for this is because KMA forecasts a much weaker storm, as I was, uh, a, a much weaker storm. And so if you look at the, um, the flow between 850 and 500, the flow now is moving towards the north. And as a result of that, you can see that for the KMA forecast, it's being pushed towards the north, whereas the CMA forecast is now pushing towards the uh, uh, west, which is very similar to that of the JMA best track. So in other words, it seems that in the, in the case of KMA, because it produces a much weaker storm, then it's being steered by the uh, mid to lower tropospheric flow, and which then causes the vortex to move towards the, the north and northeast. Whereas for the CMA, they have a better intensity forecast for this one. So therefore it, uh, it, it was able to be steered by the deep layer steering flow and pushing the storm towards the uh, Northwest, which is much closer to the best track compared with the case of uh, uh, KMA. Okay, so intensity therefore is an important parameter. So if, you're, if your model forecast intensity is wrong, uh, then, uh, and if the, the atmosphere is, a, uh, is less of a biotropic flow, that means that different layers have different uh, steering flow, then um, the intensity forecast can be a big factor. So that's one example. Another example is the size. Now the size is defined as the, as the radius of the storm uh, at which the relative vorticity is equal to zero, okay? So what you see here is that, again, is the FN, uh, uh, because JMA does not have the size uh, best track, so therefore we use the FNL as the, uh, as the size. So we use the FNL relative vorticity radius minus the forecast radius. So this time the size difference is negative again, with, but which therefore means that the forecast actually, generally speaking, has a bigger size than that of the, of the actual observations. Um, however, you can also see in this case that the ECMWF was very good. It's almost the same as that of FNL. Uh, KMA has a bit smaller size, uh, KMA and also um, CMA has a smaller size, but many of the storms have a bigger size. So for example, the, the blue one, um, Bureau of Meteorology has a big, really big 
compare with the with the observations. So let's look at one example again. In the case of Sinaku, so this one is actually for all the cases, all right? So if you look at the particular case in this case, then um, most of the models are, big, are forecasting the Sinaku to be much bigger uh, than the observations. So how does the size affect the, the forecast? So this is again the FNL analysis and subtracting the, the asymmetric flow. So you see that the tropical cyclone is embedded in this uh, trough, the westerly trough like this. And so um, it will be steered towards the Northeast. However, in the ECCC model, now if you don't go back to the ECCC, this dotted line in here, you see that it is huge, right? It's very big compared with the observations. So what you see here is now that the, the even after you subtract the, um, the tropical cyclone circulation, the tropical cyclone is actually detached from the westerly trough, okay? So it's, it's actually embedded in this um, core region, uh, the, the bottom of the trough, and it's not being steered by, this, by the storm. So as a result of that, if you look at the ECCC forecast, uh, so this is the, um, the actual um, GMA best track. So it, it starts to move towards the west first. However, the ECCC forecast directly move very far, fast towards the Northeast. Um, and so is the Bureau of Meteorology. In fact, if you look at the Bureau of Meteorology here, it also has a very big uh, tropical, a very big size compared with the observations, right? So therefore, again, if you have a, a, a different size forecast, then the, the, the track initially, so don't look, look at this, but we want to look at this part here because the, the forecast here is in 24 hours, okay? So in 24 hours, it's, uh, it's very different uh, compared with uh, the observations. And that's because the tropical cycle was way too big compared with the ob observations. All right, the third example, uh, another example is Hagabit. So in, in, in the case of Hagabit, um, we have uh, the tropical cyclone forecast, uh, the, the GMA best track is moving towards, uh, um, towards the Lazo Peninsula, whereas the, there is a big divergence in terms of the track. Now, if you look at the size, uh, V0 size means the, the, the um, the radius at which the tangential wind goes to zero. So you see that again, uh, there's a large variation in terms of the size. Some of them are very close to the uh, analysis and some of them are really big and some of them, uh, sorry, some of them are really small and some of them are really big. Um, so what we have done is that, okay, well, let's say if you run the model, uh, with different size, what would happen? So we run a model using the WARF model. Now, all these, what I showed before was actually from the global model. So we wanna see, okay, if you have a, a mesoscale model with different size, then what happens? So there are three experiments you have run. One is the best track size, like what I show in here, this is the size based on the FNL. Uh, another, ex uh, uh, an another experiment is half the size of the, of, the, of the tropical cyclone, of the observed tropical cyclone. And one is uh, uh, 1.5 times the size. So initially, this is the, uh, basically the size of the, of the tropical cyclone. This is bigger and this is smaller. Okay, so let's see, look at, let's look at the, the track themselves. So again, this is the best track. And what you see here is that if you reduce the size of the tropical cyclone, then the track actually deviates quite a bit from the best track. 
if you have the, the, the right size or a little bit bigger, then it's much closer to the, to the track. But if you have a very small size of the tropical cyclone, then there's a big deviation. And the reason is because if you have a smaller tropical cyclone, like in this, in the, in, in the, on the right hand side in here, the tropical cyclone really uh, does not interact enough with the anticyclonic flow here, which pushes the tropical cyclones towards the west. So if you have a very small tropical cyclone, then the, the steering flow will be trying to push the storm further to the north compared with the case when you have a big tropical cyclone. Okay. Now, um, you can look at this a bit more if you subtract the symmetric flow. So this one here is the total flow, but if you subtract the symmetric part, you can see it much better. So when you have the best track size, then the tropical cyclone is being steered towards the west. Very nicely, you can see that the cyclonic giant here steering flow are steering the tropical cyclone this way. However, if you have a very small tropical cyclone, then instead of being steered towards the west, it will be then steered towards the north. So therefore the size of the tropical cyclone will, all, will, uh, will interact with the different parts of, this, of the uh, large scale circulation. And so if your model has a wrong size of the tropical cyclone, it will also be steered towards the wrong part of the, of the uh, towards the different direction and therefore give you a different forecast, right? So, so far we have looked at the size characteristics, right? So we have looked at the intensity. And so if you have a, a, a wrong forecast of the intensity, the, the, the tropical cyclone will be steered by a different level or different layer of the steering flow and therefore it can move differently. For the size, if you have a different uh, size circulation, then it, will, it may be steered by a different um, part of the large scale circulation. And therefore the, the track of the forecast, uh, the track of the tropical cyclone will also be affected. So these two are the important uh, parts related to the forecast of the tropical cyclone characteristics. Now we want to look at a little bit about what about if your forecast of the large scale flow is wrong. Um, all right, so let's say look at the um, case of a monsoon gyre. So here is a monsoon gyre for Typhoon Maggie in 2010. Again, this is the asymmetric circulation. Now at 1200, uh, UTC on the 18th of October, you have a huge uh, monsoon giant here where the tropical cyclone is like that. Uh, but one day, uh, about one day later, the monsoon giant is now much weaker and the tropical cyclone is now in here, right? So this is the FNL analysis, so this is the real thing. Now, but if you look at the forecast, of the NSEP here. So NSEP was able to forecast this, uh, the, um, the, so, so the, the time is exactly the same, okay? So uh, 18, uh, 1200 UTC, 19, 1800 UTC. So this is 18, 1200 for the NSEP. So it also forecast a huge um, monsoon giant here. And then for the NSEP in the, on the 19th, then the the uh, the monsoon giant weakens a bit more. However, on this for the CMA, the monsoon giant uh, is much big bigger even on the nineteenth, right? So you can see that the the in in the beginning is and at seventy two hours it's not too bad. You still have this monsoon giant, but uh, on the nineteenth. Uh, at 18.00, the monsoon giant is still much larger than these two cases, than this case, the NSAP case, or the analysis, okay? So as a result of that, the steering of the vortex in the CMA model will be very different from that in the NSAP model. 
All right, so because of that, you can see that in the CMA model, because the, the monsoon jai was huge, so it will continue to push the tropical cyclone towards the west. However, for the NSAP, because here on the 19th, the, the monsoon jai basically disappeared, and now it actually has an anticyclonic flow, and therefore it was able to push the tropical cyclone towards the north. So not only do you have the problem with the tropical cyclone characteristics, but if your model uh, is not able to forecast the large scale flow, in this case, the monsoon gyre, then it could lead to um, a very different forecast. So this is the NSEP and this is the CMA, All right? So the monsoon gyre uh, forecast becomes critical in this case, uh, and, and obviously you can see that the, the, the error can be extremely large for CMA compared with that of NSEP. <coughs> um, similarly, you can look at the case of Muifa in 2011 in the for, uh, looking at the forecast of the subtropical high. So at this time, the subtropical high is like this. The, FM, the final analysis. So again, asymmetric flow, you have a, 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 a tropical cycle here being steered towards the northwest. Uh, however, in the ECCC model, the, the tropical cyclone, um, the, the, the anticyclonic flow, the subtropical high is much stronger. Right, much stronger than that of the analysis. Whereas the UK Met Office model is much stronger, but in the east-west direction. So if you look at this one here, um, the, the ECCC model has a subtropical high like this, but the UK Met Office has a subtropical high extended very far west. So as a result of that, the tropical cyclone it's actually being pushed um, towards the West a lot more. So therefore you can see in here that the UK Met Office model, the, the, because of the intense subtropical high in here, it actually pushed the tropical cyclone all the way to the West, right? This is the UK Met Office model. Whereas the ECCC this time was actually very good uh, uh, because it was able to to have an anticyclone kind of similar to that of the um, observed. And so as a result of that, it has a much better forecast. Give me a minute. My, my office motion sensor just went off. So the, the light <laughs> went off, okay? So, so you can see that the, the forecast of the subtropical high is also critical in terms of so uh, we have two examples. One is the forecast of the monsoon jays and forecast of the tropical high. So uh, first of all, uh, before I go on, let me give a bit of a short summary. I still have a few more slides to go. So um, uh, large get track forecast errors can occur when the following are incorrectly predicted. TC characteristics, strength of the monsoon gyre, and the strength and extension of the subtropical high. Now, I, I want to discuss a little bit about the possible reasons for these incorrect predictions. So of course, we actually discussed yesterday at the, at the virtual dinner uh, uh, that one, one reason is because you don't have enough data to, to, to initialize the model and also the data simulation uh, may not be good enough and so therefore the, the, the initial conditions were wrong. The model resolution will also be affected because as you can see for the intensity forecast, ECMWF actually has the, the best intensity forecast, even though it's still uh, weaker than the observed, but nevertheless, they are closer to the observed. Uh, and the reason for this is because the ECMWF has probably the highest resolution model of among all those that I, we have examined. The model physics. Right? So the model physics, as we also talked about that yesterday, that the, whether it's a cumulus parameterization or the microphysics scheme, 
uh, or the penetrated boundary layer, they all can contribute towards the incorrect predictions. So I want to show an example that's not done by me. This is another a study by Sun et al. in Jazz, looking at the effect of microphysics scheme on the subtropical high, which then actually modifies the, the, the strength of the subtropical high and therefore leads to a, a different prediction. So they ran a model looking at the case of, I think this is also Typhoon Maggie, uh, for different, um, different microphysics schemes. So you have the WSM3, the Lin scheme, WSM6, and also the Thomson scheme. So you see that in this case, the, for this model, uh, for this particular case, the WSM3 seems to be the best, whereas all the others uh, 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 have a much larger error and SR means the subtropical ridge. So what, they, what they're showing is this, that the, for the W, so this is the observed uh, for at 500 at, at, at two different times. I think this is the initial, and this is sometime uh, after, uh, it's maybe about one day or two days after. So what you see, is that the WSM3 has a, so initially it's about the same. This is the initial conditions. And this is sometime afterwards. I think it's two or three days afterwards. So what you see here is that the, uh, whereas initially it's about the same, but using different uh, medical physics scheme for the WSM3, the subtropical ridge is maintained quite a bit, very similar to the observations. So you can see that tropical cyclone can be therefore steered towards the west. However, for all the other three schemes, the Lin, WSM6, and Thompson, that the, the, the subtropical ridge is split. And as a result, the tropical cyclone moves towards the north. Okay. So therefore, the, uh, there is a, uh, the microphysics scheme not only affects the tropical cyclone itself, but it also affects the strength of the subtropical high. So they propose um, a mechanism like this, that improper choice of the microphysics schemes can lead to excess hydrometeors in the tropical cyclone, which then leads to more cloud component of hydrometeors, leads to condensation warming in the outer regions and the subtropical high. Uh, and then it also leads to more precipitation component of the hydrometeors, lead to evaporative cooling and therefore changes the, the temperature uh, at, the, at 500 uh, because of the upper warmer, warm, warmer in the upper levels and uh, cooler in the lower levels, decreasing in the uh, 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 subtropical high intensity and early northward turning. So the, the basic mechanism is that there is an interaction between the, the tropical cyclone circulation due to the in, um, microphysics scheme that modifies the subtropical high itself. Okay, so, so there's a very important uh, concept in here is that the, it's not that the subtropical high uh, evolution changes by itself. It's the interaction between the, the, the connection associated with the tropical cyclone that changes the intensity of the subtropical high. Okay, so, um, Obviously, there are a lot of other studies on this, but I just want to show that the, the modification of the large scale flow is not, it could be due to the tropical cyclone itself. Okay. So, um, just to summarize, then, is that the models still have large forecast errors. And we have said about this, and, uh, and further improvements will likely come with better model physics. All right, so I'll just stop here. I think this is the last slide, yeah. So we have about 20 minutes for an overall discussion of um, all the topics that I have covered in the last five and a half hours. Thank you. So thank you very much for very, very long talk of almost six hours and uh, do you have any question or comment? If you have any question or comment, 
of course, you know, you can ask questions on this uh, forecast error topic, but uh, other topics are fine if you have anything. Excuse me, I have one question in the last topic. Yes. Uh, is this numerical simulation using atmosphere and the cloud radiation scheme? You mean this, this one here? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I have to go back to the what, what kind of radiative scheme they use. Um, uh, I, I, I don't remember. So yes, of course they have a radiative scheme, but I don't know which one they use. Uh, because uh, I think that uh, the microphysics can be related to the uh, cloud coverage for in the upper troposphere uh, yes. around the tropical cyclone. Yes, 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 of course. Yes, um, the radiative scheme could be also a, a contribution so, but what they pro um, so maybe if you modify the radiative scheme, uh, the situation could change. Uh, but I don't know what I, I don't know what radiative scheme they use. Okay, so you focus on the simple microphysics uh, inference. Okay. They focus on the microphysics. I, this is not studied by me. I just. Uh, uh, I, I thought this would be interesting to 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 look at. Uh, so it was not my study. Ah yes yes. Yeah. So um, please, please go back to this. Go go, go to the paper in Jazz. Uh -huh. Okay. You can have a look at this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Enomoto san, please. Uh, thank you very much for interesting talk and uh, our survey on. Are the factors causing a truck error. Uh, I agree with you uh, with those factors and that uh, uh, which are consistent with my experience. Uh, I changed the initial condition and or model or uh, to uh, disentangle uh, the factors uh, due to initial condition and models. And uh, uh, as you pointed out, uh, uh, if you don't have enough intensity or depth of the uh, cyclone, you don't get uh, the correct uh, steering flow, uh, thereby causing uh, large truck air. And uh, I find that in the initial stage of the development, uh, which is the case, uh, I looking at the uh, uh, daily uh, when the tropical cyclones are developing, uh, many uh, models from the uh, operational focus centers uh, tend to underestimate the intensity of tropical cyclones. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and I, if at later time you get the deeper uh, cyclones and the uh, truck converges. And uh, I think it is uh, beneficial to uh, you know, intent, uh, uh, artificially intensify uh, until we get a large computer and uh, 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 which can run finer mesh. And my question is, uh, if, if the intensity is important, we, we could use regional model uh, but in that case, uh, we have boundary condition that is from the course uh, global model, and that uh, gives a uh, wrong uh, steering flow, and that's very problematic. Uh, that's my comment and question. Um, yes, but it depends on how how big your your regional model is. So if you if you have a uh, uh, regional model with high resolution and the domain is uh, right. is, is big enough that the buffer zone would not affect too much the uh, the circulation of the tropical cyclone then it might be okay um, I, I, I I or maybe I mean you people now have been so for example uh, ECMWF now has a, a very high resolution global model so that might be uh, uh, one possibility, although I, I always um, 
Although one thing that we have never covered here is that the for intensity forecasting, my feeling is that it's not just the resolution itself. It is the um, the two 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 things. One is the the physics, and secondly, is that whether the model is a couple model. Uh, we have done some studies, which I've not talked about here, so we can talk about that some other time, is that the ocean interaction with the tropical cyclone actually is very important, uh, not only for the intensity forecast, but we have studied that, look at the, if you have um, an SST um, asymmetry, that actually causes the convection to be asymmetric. And as we all said, that when you have an asymmetric convection, that it will also change the potential vorticity tendency and therefore change the track. So, um, but, but if you have an atmosphere only model, then you're not able to look at the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere. So my feeling is that when you want to look at uh, the forecast of track and intensity, you probably should go to a couple more. I agree. That's my comment. Okay, any other question or comment? Any question or comment is welcome. or you can use chat. Somebody was commenting on the microphysics yesterday. Uh, was that you, Kanada san that you asked about the microphysics or I forgot who was asking about the microphysics. Uh, not me, uh, Tsuchino san maybe. Tsuchino oh. san. Yes, I ask. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, uh, by the way, the uh, RLPM, the radiation scheme was in sun. Okay. So, so Jino san do you, do you have any comments on the microphysics uh, studies? Yeah, I have no comment and uh, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but I think that's just very important that we probably need to more I mean, I'm not a microphysics scheme expert, so people in the audience who who are um, these uh, cumulus scheme uh, microphysics scheme experts can can think about whether uh, how much the influence is on the on the track. We have done some studies on looking at the um, the impact of the microphysics scheme on the size forecast, uh, and and it seems that. There's also a big difference uh, when you have um, different microphysics schemes that the, the size of the of the storm uh, is different, and because the size will therefore is related to the beta effect. So I think, uh, and and also if it's close to the topography, then the uh, close to land, then the size. Uh, of the storm will therefore interact differently with the with the topography, and hence change the track forecast. So, so in other words, the the, the microphysics scheme seems to be a very uh, crucial um, factor in in determining whether the model forecast is good or not. So that will be something that people can 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 do more studies on. Okay, Sawada-san, please. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, yeah. uh, thank you very much, Chan. Uh, uh, interesting topic. Uh, actually, I agree with your com uh, comment about uh, microphysics. Um, I studied the impact of microphysics on TC size and intensity more than 10 years ago. <laughs> so, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I, uh, through my experience, I totally agree with your idea. But, uh, no. Uh, aside from that topic, uh, I am wondering the the physics. Uh, there are many physics. So um, 
and、uh, not only the microfilm, but also cumulus schemes and PBL schemes.、Uh, these also h a s a、uh, significant impact on TC. Yes, agreed. And the size, and I, of course,、uh, track. So, do you have any idea? I have.、Uh, I have a Uh, I am interested in the diagnosis of tr track errors. So, do you have any idea、uh, how,、uh, I, how do we、uh, diagnose the track errors due to which、um, scheme?、Um, so, so, what we have done、uh, in the two papers that I presented.、Uh, It's that、uh, we look at,、um, uh, as I show you, look at the size and intensity、uh, and, and, and so on. But it's difficult to look at the, the physics schemes because、um, uh, we haven't, we, we, so, so for looking at the,、uh, the different physics schemes, you will need to look at, run more model experiments like what we have done with the、uh, size forecast. So,、um, My feeling is that the, the PBL scheme is probably important、uh, near landfall.、Mm -hmm. uh, over the ocean, it's probably not、um, very significant.、Uh, however, the, and then the cumulus schemes, I think more and more models are now going to such high resolutions that maybe the, the cumulus scheme is not. As critical, and, and many models actually、uh, not use the cumulus schemes anymore.、Um, um, actually, for the regional model,、uh, I think yes, but the、uh, operational center still u s e cumulus parameterization. Yeah,、uh, right. So that, that's, a, that, that's a,、uh, something that needs to be studied. But the, only, the other thing is about the cumulus scheme that I、okay. always think is that.、Um, Uh, I have talked about, discussed this with、um, uh, people in the Met office, UK Met office, and also ECMWF. And my, my thinking is this that for the cumulus scheme,、um, generally speaking, in the model, in the global model, you only use one scheme, right? So you, you cannot use different schemes. However, in the tropics, and especially for tropical cyclones,、um, The, 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 the physics of convection in tropical cyclones will be very different from the physics of, let's say, mid latitude cyclones, right?、Uh, in, in term, because in the, in the tropics, we have a lot more warm rain、um, and the freezing level is a lot higher. So we have lots of warm rain processes, the co collision coalescence process. Is much more important in the tropics than in the middle latitudes,、uh, and especially in tropical cyclones,、uh, because of the strong vertical motion. And so, therefore, the, the hydrometeors, the, the water drops really、uh, have not enough time to,、uh, to freeze very quickly because of the strong vertical motion. So,、uh, I, I always wonder whether the same cumulus scheme can be applied. Uh, globally,、uh, for all types of connection. I, I have asked this question many times to, to modelers in ECMWF and Met Office, and they all say that, oh, yeah, 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 we can use the same scheme, no problem. But my feeling is that because the, the, the physics is different,、mm -hmm. then maybe we need to think about、um, different connective.、Uh, Uh, cumulus uh, parameterization schemes for the tropics versus the mid latitudes.、Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just my, my, my feeling all the time that、uh, you should not be using the same one. But I'm not a modeler. I'm not a cumulus scheme、uh, expert. So I don't know whether that's possible or whether it's just something that people should be looking at. Yeah, it's a difficult point. And,、uh... As for the last point,、uh, I heard from my colleague、uh, that the UK Met Office has、uh, two uh, packages 
I, it means that one is for tropics, uh, the other is uh, middle top, middle top, <laughs> middle really? of versions. So oh, okay. they tro they they try to uh, combine two, but uh, still uh, st struggling. <laughs> so I'm not sure they already completed or not. So, but from yeah, that, that experience. Yeah. yeah, that would be interesting to see because if they can uh, somehow use different schemes, then you might get actually get better results. Uh -huh. right. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, comment on the truck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I strongly agree with Sawada san uh, in that, you know, the comparison of various models and various schemes is quite important in terms of uh, uh, reduction of drug focus errors. And uh, my comment is a little bit different from the kind of point of view. Uh, I recently noticed that the you know, detection uh, of center position also can cause the drug focus errors. You know, initial position uh, determination is sometimes difficult, uh, in particular in a Genesis stage. And uh, from some of my calculation, it can explain one third of track forecast errors, especially in a one day, two day forecasts. So do you have any idea on that concept? So just as I would like to say, you know, it's very difficult to determine the center position when the tropical cyclone is weak. Uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um... However, I will have a counter argument, <laughs> which is that you really don't know where the storm was in the beginning. So uh, whatever you, you use as, the, as your, your best track position uh, will already have a large uncertainty. So I don't know how that uncertainty uh, can be reduced because Obviously, in when the tropical cyclone is very weak, uh, you really don't know where the center is, right? So, um, I mean, I've been an operational forecaster myself. So, uh, when I was in the Hong Kong Observatory, and I remember many cases in which, when the tropical cyclone was first formed, it was very difficult to identify where the center was. Maybe it's better now with the with the microwave and uh, different types of satellites, uh, like what uh, um, uh, Roger Edson always advocates is that the, you use the different types of microwave sensors to and, th and different frequencies uh, to be able to identify the low level center. But um, you are probably right that there will be a part of the track forecast errors is due to the the, the wrong estimation of the position. But the, the problem is you really don't know which one is the, the correct one, right? So that could be, um, it's a chicken and an egg problem, <laughs> I think. Yes. Okay, so any other question or comment? Okay, Nasuno san, please. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for such an intensive and uh, interesting lecture. I have one simple question. Uh, in the last talk topic, you showed that the in some cases, uh, the uh, steering flow is important. In, in some cases, TC size forecast is uh, critical to the uh, track prediction. In another case, monsoon gyre prediction is critical. And uh, do you have any uh, perspective on uh, which uh, would be a critical factor before a uh, typhoon is coming? While it is developing, uh, can we identify uh, which factor would be most critical to the uh, forecast, track forecast, um, depending uh, on 
uh, environment uh, such as sea surface temperature distribution or water circulation variability or uh, weather and snap to scale wave activity or do you have any uh, suggestion to identify uh, the critical factor to forecast track forecast? I think I think it depends on the uh, individual case. Um, so we uh, have analyzed we have analyzed um, uh, I think we have analyzed twelve years of uh, ticky forecasts, and that's mm -hmm. why we came up with the different uh, possibilities uh, mm -hmm. for uh, the the factors related to tropical cyclones like intensity and size, and also for looking at the, the synoptic uh, conditions like the monsoon chai and the subtropical high. So, uh, I, I mean, for a particular case, um, that it really, it could be a combination of some of these factors, uh -huh. and it could be one of the factors could be dominant. Yeah. But my, 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 our suggestion in the paper is that when you, when you look at the, the forecast uh, of a particular model, uh -huh. and I mean, these days people tend to just look at the ensemble mean and, and say, this is where it's going to go. And, and I always tell, when I discuss with forecasters, uh, when I have the time, I always say that you need to look at whether the forecast, the model forecast of the large scale flow, for example, the monsoon jaya, uh, has been correct or not. So maybe it was uh, it was wrong from the beginning, then you can just forget about the, that, that model. You can look at some other model that has a good forecast of the monsoon giant or the subtropical high or the intensity. So, so my, my feeling is that you need to look at uh, how good the model has been performing in a particular tropical cyclone. And so therefore, in some cases, uh, as I showed, um, for example, the ECCC model, generally speaking, is really bad. In, uh, if we evaluate all the models, it's probably one of the, uh, one of the worst. However, I show one case in which the model was actually very good in predicting the strength of the subtropical high. And so therefore, it was able to forecast the, the track. So it's really important to look at the history of the individual model uh, for a particular storm and see how good the model has been performing in that particular, for that particular storm. So to understand whether that, whether we can trust that model forecast. That's how I would approach um, for a part, uh, in, in, in the real case situation. Um, and of course, then we'll need to be coupled with the, uh, the, the history of their forecast of the tropical cyclone track. If their forecast tropical cyclone track has been bad, then you probably don't want to continue using that model. That's how I, I would uh, suggest. Yeah, so it's very difficult to identify which factor is more critical. It de really depends on the, on the storm. Uh, yeah. However, my feeling is that, for example, when the tropical cyclone is it's, uh, further south, like in the deep tropics, um, generally speaking, uh, the steering flow is quite um, is quite barotropic in that. So, so it doesn't the direction doesn't change very much from the lower to the upper troposphere. So, I think in that case, the intensity might not be very important because if it's barotropic, then it doesn't matter which level you, you want to use. But if you go to higher latitudes, then you can have a shear flow. Uh, and, and in that case, then the intensity forecast becomes critical uh, because then you, if, if your intensity forecast is wrong, then the vortex will be steered by a different level of flow and you'll get a different forecast. So these need to be systematically uh, examined. But unfortunately, um, I, there are very few studies on this uh, because it is not what I say is uh, not glamorous. 
you you don't get to publish in very good journals for this uh, these types of studies. In fact, uh, we have we have struggled to to publish this paper uh, because they say, ah, oh, you know, this is not really. How do you know that uh, your cases can be generalized? Of course, you cannot generalize, but this is important for forecasters to understand. So that's why not many people are doing this. You don't get promoted for doing this. <laughs> Sorry, do I, do I answer your question? I think, I think it's, uh, it is not easy to answer your question because there's no one factor that's more critical than the others, I think. Yes, thank you very much for your comment. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we can have a few more questions or comments. Anybody else? Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Okay, uh, thanks for interesting talk. Uh, my question is about the effect of topography. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, in Luzon Island, uh, uh, there are two ridges. Uh, one, one narrow ridge is in uh, east coast and there to be high and wide ridge, ridge uh, located on the east coast of Luzon Island. Uh, are, these, uh, are these two ridges uh, uh, interact? Uh, Interacted to uh, to change the TC tracks, or uh, uh, these two ridges uh, presented as one one uh, south north ridge, uh, which is the uh, it, uh, which is correct. Okay, uh, good question. Uh, in fact, we have done this. Um, the the ridge to the east is very very uh, narrow. And, uh, and, and, and relatively uh, lower in height. So we have done an experiment with and without that narrow ridge mm -hmm. and the effect is very similar. Mm -hmm. so, so in other words, the, the narrow ridge uh, because of its narrow, so it's so narrow and not so high, then the, its effect is minimum. So it's mm -hmm. the mainly the ridge uh, on the Western side of Luzon Island. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so any other question? Just one or two questions? Okay, if not, uh, I'd like to close the Typhoon Seminar. Uh, thank you again, Johnny, Professor Johnny Chan. Big applause, please. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and I, I hope you have uh, some understanding of the of the physics of tropical cyclone motion, and uh, I look forward to meeting some of you uh, in person sometime when the COVID pandemic is over. And I would like to hope, hopefully, I can see you and we can discuss some more. And I think, uh, following on Ito Sang's uh, comment, I think we should probably mobilize more people to study tropical cyclone track uh, because I don't think this is a topic uh, that has been solved. Uh, so there are still lots of things that we need to do. So good luck. And if you, if any of you would be interested in doing this, I would be happy to uh, collaborate. Uh, and um, you can probably find my email somewhere uh and and contact me and i'll be happy to uh to discuss with you okay so thank you very much for your invitation okay thank you very much okay so professor uh nino uh will uh you know final concluding remarks please professor nino okay professor chan it was a great pleasure that you kindly accepted to give lectures in this typhoon seminar on behalf of all the participants of this seminar, I would like to thank you for having spent your precious time to give nice lectures 
particularly focused on movement of tropical cyclones, ranging from basic mechanism to practical forecast problems, and also uh, to participate in uh, fruitful discussions. We learned many things and were very much stimulated. There are many young scientists who are working on their master or doctor thesis. I'm sure your lectures stimulated them and helped advance their studies. I hope this opportunity will enhance our future communications and cooperation in mutual research. Finally, I wish you and all the participants good health and further success in research. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so this is the end of the Typhoon Seminar. Anything from Shinoda-san? Any comment or anything from Shinoda-san? Okay, one, one, please, please give uh, one announcement to all audiences. So, uh, 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 so uh, this time seminar is of 11th one, isn't it, Ito-san? Okay, so uh, this uh, time seminar is uh, uh, we we'll conduct every year. So uh, next next Japanese uh, financial year, the Miyamoto-san will uh, have a plan to uh, conduct the next 12th uh, Taiwan seminar, but uh, the detail is not uh, uh, conducted, uh, not decided yet. So, if the uh, this, uh, if the detailed uh, structure of the next Taiwan seminar, we will announce for all audiences. So please uh, expect it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. okay thank you very That's much. All. Okay. So thank you very much and bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank bye bye. You. Thank you. Thank you very much.